Welcome back to the Fun Time Program. I am your host, John Andrew Fredrickson, here with my beautiful co-host, Vivica Volt. And we have a fun guest in the studio today. Oh my God, so many in-studio guests. I love it. Jackie Summers, aka Jack from Brooklyn. What's up? How are you doing today, Jack? I'm having a good day. How you feel? We you feel? know what? I feel fucking great. Having a drink with you, which is always one of my favorite things to do. Cheers, y'all. Happy Cheers, Friday. Yo. Even though it's not Friday. Cheers. It, yo, it's whatever the fuck day. <laughs> it's a day ending in Y. So it's a great day to drink in COVID. A- Amen. All right. Well, Amen. this is going to be a fun episode. So, Jack, tell us, tell us about you. You are jack from brooklyn are you from brooklyn born and raised i was born in queens Ooh, uh, where in queens because i was born in cool. queens too wait wait no hey, no hey, no hey, no hey. no 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 sir you better watch your motherfucking <laughs> voice nobody should watch that queens, tone for real <laughs> what part of queens i was born in jamaica queens me okay. too yo yo fam, jamaica queens hey. in the house yes but let me let me say this when my folks bought the house that my mother still lives in they weren't just the only black family on the block. They were the only black family in the neighborhood. Yep, that sounds about right. And so now like, when I Jamaica said, is real black. Oh, now Jamaica's blackity black, black. Uh-huh. But like it's when, the blackest when black. my folks moved in, it was like everyone else was like, okay, it's time to move out of the neighborhood. It's oh. wow. So oh, like, there goes the value I'm, of this I'm, neighborhood. I was born in Jamaica, Queens. I've been living in Brooklyn since 97, since my divorce. Okay. So where in Brooklyn did you start? Did you start in the same part of Brooklyn that you're currently in? My or? first place was in Cobble Hill. I okay. was right at the waterfront. Ooh. Uh, Atlantic Avenue and I forget. I forget the name of the street now. But literally at the at the Brooklyn waterfront, mm-hmm. one bedroom duplex. Two two full bathrooms, hardwood floors. One bedroom with two full bathrooms. Two the, full bathrooms that exists in New York City. Working fireplace, bitch. Uh, hardwood floors, spiral staircase to the master bedroom. Sir, skylight over the master bed. Postcard views of the skyline. I was paying a thousand bucks a month. How did you leave that place? Why did you leave that place? I was there for a decade. Okay, but like I, I left. Wait, wait, I left because I got into a fight with my landlord over illegal rent destabilization. I went to court. Mm. I won. Oh shit! I won, and then my cat died in my lap. Oh and no! And I couldn't stay there anymore, so I had to go. I literally put my shit in storage. Had didn't have anywhere to go to. I was homeless for six months. Wow! Until I found my next place. Wow! She was twenty three. Oh, wow. Your cat was 23 years old. 17 to 40. Wow. wow. Think about the changes you go through Yo, in that span to 40, of time. That is a full, that's a few lifetimes. Right. In that time frame. Just in the time from the time I was 22 to 34, I feel like I've lived like five lifetimes. Just this year, I feel like I've this lived like. This week has been a fucking lifetime. <laughs> this fucking year has been at least three to four decades long. Let's just right? be like very clear. I've lived through like seven decades already. <laughs> I was, I lived, I was alive in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, 2008, 2020, January through March, uh, like 2000. People like, will look <laughs> back in 50 years in, in college and go, so what are you studying right now? 2020. I'm studying October 1st to 7th, 2020. Yep. <laughs> well, that that seems kind of broad. Are you sure you can cover? It? <laughs> Yo, oh, I'm studying. Lord. I'm studying spring of 2020. Oh, so you're doing a master's right. program? Like That's a PhD program? Like, god damn! Oh my god, Yo, the this, history of this this era is going to be something fucking else. Year. It's not going to be possible to encapsulate. There's not oh, going to be a shorthand for this. My favorite. Sorry, my favorite part about this year is that if you were to try to write a movie about 2020, like it's too no much. One, no one will take you seriously because it's like, oh, OK, murder hornets. That's what you're going to go with. And then you're right. going to do and, nothing with and them. And then the president came down with COVID. And then <laughs> and then literally six days later was like, I'm fine. COVID's nothing to be worried I about. I barely then, remember the murder hornets. Oh, yeah. I, Apparently, yo, they're in the slaughter phase now. I barely remember the fucking... Uh, Y'all what? remember Kofifi? 
I remember Kofifi, but yo, didn't we impeach that motherfucker? Wasn't that we, this we, year? That was that. That was last year around nah, this no, time. No, no, no. Like, no, that was this year. That, it might as well have been this year. That was this year. Wasn't it summer of twenty? Nah, that was this year. It like finished the impeachment process. Finished this year. Yeah, it's been a whole year. It's been it's been a whole like decade and four. It's been four decades. So here's what's crazier. Do y'all remember like earlier this year when? we still had multiple people on the primary ballot. Like, yes, that was, that was up like in, 20 people. That was up until like February. Yeah. 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 That was, that was this fucking year. And wow. it feels like it was like literally a decade ago. That's so true. Oh my fucking God. Remember when we had the hopes and dreams that it wasn't going to be an old white guy that was going to be president oh, again? Lord. Mm. Oh Lord. I never had those hopes and dreams. Cause I, I mean, I thought Bernie was going to get it. I don't know yeah, why. But, I don't know why he, I had he's, those he's only thoughts. technically an old white guy. <laughs> he's, right. So what is he really? I mean, he's an, an old, old Jewish guy. Yeah, he's an old Jewish guy. Got it. Got but it. Like, I mean, they, they didn't get to be white till like the 1930s. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, even they, after that, they had to earn it. <laughs> oh Lord. Why this is flexible? Yeah. Oh Lord. It's a mindset, not a skin tone. Interesting. Hey. Mm-hmm. Interesting. We kind of touched on that in the last podcast with Dean. A little bit with their experience in, in Israel and how it's like, especially white supremacy is like a, a mindset. It's not just right because like you don't have to be white to be a white supremacist, and you don't have to be white to engage in white supremacist uh, values or. Yo, uh, tell me, y'all saw that Ice Cube bullshit? What? Oh, I didn't. But I like, missed it. Ice Cube is talking to the the current administration and see how they can benefit black people. Like motherfucker, have Ice you Cube, be- not Kanye. Ice Cube. Okay. First Fuck of the all, police, Ice Cube. I, 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 okay. I have so many questions because, like, none of the answers are going to make sense. Right. Because, like, I don't understand Welcome how. Welcome to 2020. I don't understand how you go from fuck the police to being an Uncle Tom. Like, that's, like, so far on. Uh, like, no, it's, I, understand, it's, it's, I understand Kanye because Kanye nah, has been a stupid it, it, asshole his whole it's life. It's white supremacy 101. Right. Let, let, we let one of these niggas through. Mm-hmm. We get them enough money mm-hmm. and then they think they one of us. They get uppity. But we treat them, you know, with a modicum of respect. Yo, it's like the whole, it's, it's one of the things that I have against, like, I don't want to say against, but like, it's one of the issues that I have with Jay-Z and Beyonce. Ugh. Because like, they somehow became representative of the black community, but they are no longer representational of the black community in any capacity because they are not living. They are not living a black life. They are living a very whitewashed version that they just happen to be black. And it's really frustrating because everyone points to Beyonce as like Queen Bay, as like the epitome of a black woman. And it's like, okay, well, first of all, she's mad light skin these days. Hey. And like she's mad light skin with blonde hair. So hey. like there's something to be said about that. And like Jay, like he stepped on a lot of fucking people to become a billionaire. And like there is no way that you became a billionaire by any. Let, let, let me let me just say this. They do a lot of good. They both do for visibility. Yeah. For individuals behind the scenes, and mm-hmm. they, do a, they do a fair amount of good for the community. But like, they're not the worst. They're not the worst. They're not the I worst. I mean, you know, they're not. I Ken, give them that. They're not Candace Owens. Yo, but, I fucking uh, hate that bitch more than anything. I hate I hate people more than Candace Owens. But yo, mm-hmm. Jay Z and Beyonce, they want to be. It's not that they're not black royalty. But she, he's not my king. No, he's she, up, he is not my T'Challa, not in nah, any capacity. No. Nah. And like, I don't look up to them and nor do I really want to be them. Like, I recognize that, like, there is something to be said about the image that comes from Beyonce and like the power that she projects and like the like image that she has created. But like, that's part of her brand. Right. Like if you saw Beyonce on a regular ass day in her house, she doesn't have her makeup perfectly done. Nah. Or if she does, it's because someone comes in and does her makeup nah. for her. And like, one of the things that has always driven me crazy is in mainstream media, you have never seen Beyonce with her natural hair. Hey, You've seen Solange, but you've never seen Beyonce with her natural hair. And like Jay Z, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the motherfucker that that popularized premature ejaculation back in the nineties? Yep. Wait, what? I don't know this yep. story. 
This motherfucker would talk about being Let like. Let me give you 90 seconds of affection. Yep. Wait, that was a brag? Yes. yes. In his song. Yes. For sure. 6 a.m. I'd be digging it out. 6.15 6 I'd, I'd be, be kicking, kicking her out. out. Motherfucker, you can't. Nah. Yep. Wow. And like he would talk about like eating her out for like 10 minutes and then kicking her out five minutes after eating her out. Yep. It's like, okay, so you gave her five minutes of dick. That's it. That's what is that? That's, the that's still foreplay, he, he, sir. He, he he bragged about premature ejaculation. Yo, I'm and just talk saying. about how he's got multiple women coming through. First of all, what you're saying is you are leaving multitudes of women unsatisfied. Yes. Because like, I don't care how good your dick is. You are not giving me five minutes of dick that I am satisfied with. No, nah, he giving you the sex version of mansplaining. Yeah, he don't let you finish. Uh... Yo, <laughs> yo, I wasn't even ready, but that is that is a golden fucking quote right there. The sex version of mansplaining. Oh, oh my fucking god, yo, the accuracy of that statement. Oh my god, you would be like, I'm, st- I, I, I'm still talking. Oh, right. I'm still I'm still speaking. Well, that sounds like a personal problem, boo. You need to get out of my house. What? And like, first of all, like he's in like the hustler fucking song talking about how he spends like 10 minutes of the 15 minutes undressing the girl. And like by the time he gets her undressed, he's already come and he's ready to go. I don't understand why they put him on the Minuteman song with like Missy Elliott, because like he is the definition. Basically. Like, yo, if you charge this motherfucker by the minute, you would still not have enough you, money to pay rent. You'd have change. Yo. Uh, <laughs> you had change back. They'd be like, hold on a second. I got a quarter and some pennies. Right? Like, I don't want, I don't need, I can stand no five minute men. Go. So who's the real black royalty? Yo, we lost him. He died recently. T'Challa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chadwick, Chadwick Boseman was he was because actually, of his role in, in no, Black he, Panther or, or more than that? He was a beautiful fucking human. And like he had actually only been acting for a very short amount of time. Like he was only a mainstream actor for a very short amount of time. But in that time, the amount of good that he did just in the industry and around the world was so impactful like he already knew he had cancer and he was going to visit uh children who were cancer patients as t'challa knowing that like he was going through a similar struggle as them without ever telling them but like giving them that hope like as t'challa and then on top of that like he fought for um his female counterpart in a movie equal pay. to be equal pay and didn't he take a pay cut so that she could he, be paid he gave part of his salary so that her pay could be equal to his yep. you know that's my king who is she i um, forget some white girl i wasn't paying was, attention exactly that i was literally just about to say some white girl <laughs> <laughs> i love that jackie just read my mind i was like i don't know some blonde white girl Yo, be careful what you think i'm mad empathic i <laughs> uh, love it Oh my God. So what, what led you into the bar industry? Hospitality. I, I really like drinking. Okay. It's real fun. Because you have your own liqueur now. What is it called? So I, I make a product called Surreal Liqueur, but what led me to making my own product was I had a cancer scare 10 years ago. My doctor found a tumor the size of a golf ball inside my spine. And he said, what was the process for finding that? Just, just out of curiosity. Oh, oh, this is like this is. I'm gonna tell you the whole story because we got time. Mm-hmm. Well, we got <laughs> so, we have all the time in the world for you, Jackie. I had I had sciatica, real bad, and from what age? I was forty. I was forty two. That's when you developed your sciatica. I had, I had sciatica so bad I couldn't sleep, and I'll never forget one night I was laid up against the wall. With my legs up against the wall, because that was the only thing that didn't hurt. I didn't sleep. I got up out of bed at 6 o'clock in the morning. I was laying on the floor with on my back with my knees to a chest like, with my knees to my chest like a dead bug. Mm-hmm. And I laid there for like three hours trying to figure out if I was going to call in sick for work. And I got up at 9 a.m. because I had to pee. And I attempted to cross my living room floor. And the first step I took, my leg gave out. And I slipped and hit my head on a bottle of wine that that I'd finished the night before. And I'm laying on the floor, pain shooting down my leg, not on the back of my head. And my first thought was, holy shit, I can't have sex. (laughs) 
I'm no good on my front. I'm no good on my back. I can't sit. I can't stand. Like, I need to get my ass to a doctor. Wow. We can't take you nowhere, Jackie. You can take me all kinds of places. (laughs) But I got to my doctor, and when he couldn't figure out the cause of my sciatica, he sent me for an MRI. And sure enough, three-fourths of my nerve sheath was blocked off with this tumor. So you're having trouble getting signals from your legs to your brain and back. Oh, yeah. my God. So the doctors tell me you have a 90. The doctor says the doc, what they said was, we think you have an ependymoma. I said, I made that face. I said, <laughs> I don't know what an ependymoma is, but it sounds like cancer. He said, it's only cancer 95 percent of the time. <laughs> oh, geez. oh, yeah. Just like only 95 percent. We need it's, to work on your bedside manner. Right. You could have just started with cancer and like come back with like I, there's a 5 percent chance that it's I not. Sa- I said, why do you say we think? You say, well, we think because it's inside your spine, we can't do a biopsy. I said, well, if you can't do a biopsy and it's into my, inside my spine, how do you get it out? He said, oh, that's easy. We're going to take a bone out of your spine. That's do a, they replace it? Don't that, I, yeah, that was, don't I need the bones right? in my spine? He was like, I mean, of all things in your body. We're going to take a bone out of your spine. We're going to take your nerve. You're going to take your spinal cord out through the hole. We're going to open up your spinal cord. And do neurosurgery because this tumor is attached to your spinal cord. So there's a 95% chance of death. A 95% chance of death. And there's a 50% chance of paralysis if you live. Because we don't know. We won't know until after if you've got permanent nerve damage. Good luck. You oh should get. You should, you, should organize, you, should, you should organize your papers. They wow. actually said that. They, yeah, my doctor said, organ, do, you have your, do, you have your paperwork, do you have your paperwork in order? Yes. Jesus 42. Christ. So I consent to the surgery and then I do the only thing that makes sense. I go on vacation. Yeah, I mean, you might as well live up your Me life just in case. and 10 friends in a beach house in Cancun and shopping yes. cars full of alcohol. I'm having the best vacation of my life. And I'll never forget waking up one morning early, sunrise, before anyone else you know, had worn off the hangover and thinking to myself, I'm going to have a sunrise walk on the beach because I don't know if I'm going to get to do this again. Right. And I grabbed a bottle of Mezcal and I'm walking down the beach in Mexico, Mezcal in hand, uh, talking to death. And she had interesting things to say. Wow. Yeah, that sounds about right. So the first thing is death is always right. (laughs) I mean, there's no arguing with death. No, she's always right. But we're talking, and I'm drinking mezcal out the bottle, and she says to me, and I'll forget this, you know, Jack, this is not the first time I've come for you. This is the, this is just the first time you're paying attention. Wow. And I thought about it, and she was right. Yo, I've been shot. I've been stabbed. I've been in a catastrophic car accident. I've almost drowned twice. From what I can tell, it's not my second go around. This is at least my fourth or fifth go around. You are a cat. Sir, I have lives. <laughs> you, I have you've had lives. multiple at this point. So I get back to New York and I'm at peace. Like I've never been more at peace because I know I'm going to die. And I'm good with it. Like I'm okay. And I get into the hospital. They put you in that gown where your ass is hanging out. Yep. And they put this thing in your arm and they say, come back from 100. And you go, nine did not. And you, <laughs> knock, and you knock the fuck out. <laughs> and I went to sleep thinking I'm never going to wake up again. The next thing I remember, they wheeled me down the hallway on a gurney. And I'm singing Material Girl <laughs> at the top of my lungs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a material girl. I'm a material girl. You I, would. Yo, Are you it. proud of that moment? I remember it very clearly. I get into the recovery room. Were you already singing before you realized that you were singing? My first memory of waking up is singing Material Girl. Oh, my God. I get into the recovery room and my nurse asked me, how do you feel? And I look at her and I go, like a virgin. <laughs> That's for the very first time. Oh she my says, God. She says, Do you know your name? I 
look at her and I go, I'm Lady Gaga. She says, sir, do you know who you are? I say, I realize I am not Lady Gaga. I'm Madonna. <laughs> you are the worst patient. Yo, anesthesia is a motherfucker. <laughs> Wait, so why were they still asking you this while you're asking on? you these questions? Because they need to know if, if you're an, out enough from under the anesthesia, out enough from under the anesthesia to have a serious conversation with you. Ah, uh, okay. Right. So she says to me, Do you have any weaknesses? They asked, they asked me that question because I'd had spinal surgery. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any feeling beneath my rib cage. Wow. So you're like, okay. I didn't, well, I I didn't, I didn't know if I had feet. Literally. Hey, like, what's a weakness at this point? I'm I, still high. I said, chocolate, chocolate, whiskey, and raven haired women. <laughs> I can't take you nowhere. You can take me anywhere. But by this was time. Was this a raven haired woman that you happened to be wait, speaking Wait, wait. By to? this time, I realized she was cute, right? Ah. <laughs> So I've got tubes up my nose and tubes up both hands. And I reached out and put my hand on her knee. Wow. And I said to her, it's important for me that you understand that just because I came out of surgery, singing Madonna and claiming to be a material girl does not mean I do not like girls. <laughs> you had to defend yourself at that moment. Well, no, I didn't have, I just wanted her to you, know. You just wanted to make sure she knew that you were on her team. Clarification. <laughs> like, hey, I swing your direction if you about it. At which, at which point she figured out I was ready to talk to my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, and you're sober enough. Okay. My doctor came out and he said one word. He said benign. Wow. Oh, my 5% God. chance and I lived. And you're here to drink with us today and walking just I was, fine. I was, I, they didn't expect me to stand. I was standing the next day. What was your that experience when you heard benign? I was too high to know. Was there a moment afterwards where you kind of felt a, a relief, a, a, a change? Of, I, you know, a, it's a, a funny thing. You make your peace with death. You can't unmake it. Wow. I know I'm going to die. Like, that much is 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 not clear. Death is a lover. She's been with me since I was 10 years old, but I didn't get it back then. Like, death has been with me all my life and she's with everybody else, but they don't get it either. Mm -hmm. It it didn't, it did not give me a sense of relief. It gave me a sense of purpose. I was director of new media and production at a fashion magazine at the time. I got back to my job a week after having this life-changing surgery and I got into a four-hour argument with the director of photography because she thought the blue, she because she, she thought the pinks on the cover of the magazine were too pink and the grass wasn't green enough. What the actual fuck? And all I could think was, is this what I lived for? Like, I can't do this. Would it have had meaning to you before that? Yes, but it was different. I didn't want to spend another week in my life arguing if the pinks were too pink. Right. So I came in the next week ready to give in my resignation. And before I could open my fat yap, they offered me a package. I didn't even look at it. I signed, cleaned out my desk, and I was gone. But I have this very distinct memory of a week after I left corporate America. Twenty, I left 25 years of mm -hmm. corporate America behind me. But it was like, what do I really want to do with myself? And the thing I wanted to do more than anything else in the world is day drink. <laughs> Yo. I Honestly, be, you know what? Yeah, I appreciate I want, that I love it. I want to be around cool ass people yep. in the Enjoy middle of the day. Enjoying yourself day drinking. Not in just the like middle of the week. Mm -hmm. talking about shit that matters. I want to have good food and good booze and I wanted to monetize it. And when I couldn't figure out who was going to pay me to day drink, I thought to myself, I'll launch a liquor brand. How hard can it be? <laughs> <laughs> I am Caribbean uh, in heritage, eth ethnically. Which part of the Caribbean? My mother's parents are from Barbados. My mm -hmm. father's parents are from St. Kitts Nevis. So I'm 100% coconut. Yo, <laughs> I appreciate every part of that answer because I'm half Belizean. Hey. And I'm a quarter Dominican. Hey. And a quarter Russian. Yeah. <laughs> hey, don't, don't knock the riskies. Yo, I mean. Embrace your heritage. Peace, diets. 
Oh, you sh- you speak Russian? I, I know how to curse in Russian. <laughs> something something tells me you know how to curse in a few languages. Uh, <laughs> what? I would, I would never. Shocked, shocked. Where are my pearls? I need to clutch them, sir. Scandalized. <laughs> so every Caribbean family makes this thing called sorrel. Mm-hmm. It's hibiscus flowers and other spices and rum. And every Caribbean family thinks their version is the best. Obviously, because there you can't tell nothing to a Caribbean family. No. Like, no. You can be like, try telling something to a Dominican. Tell them their cake isn't right. And they will laugh at you and be like, excuse you. Nope. You so can't tell nothing to a this, Caribbean. This basic beverage has been in the Caribbean for 400 years. Mm-hmm. No one's ever made it into a commercial beverage alcoholic. I told myself I'm going to be the first person to do this. I have no money. I have no background at all. I have <laughs> no experience in food chemistry. Yo, this sounds like the perfect combination of things to get you into this industry. So it took uh, 600 something tries. 623. Wow. Failed versions before I got the actual version that is shelf stable. You can open it, close it, put it in, in the back of your car, boil it, freeze it, nuke it. Because there's like plenty of versions that like you would make at home or have like in your family. Yeah. But like it's kind of like making um, coquito where yes. like you can make a coquito at home. It goes bad in a week. Exactly. It goes bad in a week. My what? Ver- what happened to those 623 other versions that... I poured them down the drain. Ah, oh, bummer. No, like, this is the part where I tell the joke, if you think you have an idea that's so good no one's ever thought of it before, it's probably a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a reason no one has done this shit before. Someone's probably thought of it and realized it's oh, not this, worth this my time. this is impossible. Somebody put yeah. 10 years of their life into it and decided it wasn't doable. Somebody <laughs> probably did 622 versions. Oh, yep. that and poor stopped. motherfucker. <laughs> Ain't I, that the truth, though? How many times has that happened? You know? Like, what happened on the 623rd time when you tasted it and when it, you felt no, like you it, had it, got it, it right? It was a eureka moment because I actually saw... Pectins. I saw complex polysaccharides form inside of a bottle. Everything in on a molecular level that is insoluble attached to the alcohol and becomes a jelly, basically. And mm-hmm. because it is lighter than the water underneath, it rises to the top. Scoop that off. Everything beneath is not just perfectly crystal clear, but shelf stable. Nice. I knew. So I so I so I, I invented it and then I had no money. Like, well, because the truth is, I... if you don't have a million bucks and you're trying to sell a liquor brand, it's basically impossible. I didn't have a million bucks. Right. Uh, I went to my friends who had MBAs and I said, how do you write a business plan? And they looked at me and they went, uh-huh. what is the point of you? Like, no, because my- <laughs> people have written that shit. To graduate. Right. And I'm like, but they hadn't have, written one in oh, real life. Right. You have a whole ass MBA and you can't tell me how to write a business plan. Nah. I swear to God. MBAs are not to, to MBAs are to how you, so how, MBAs are for how you can run a business. Yep. They're not for how you can start a business. That's right. I wrote my own, I wrote my own prospectus. I got the seed capital together myself. I launched a distillery. I make this first ever commercial version of this beverage called Sorel. And it just does gangbusters. It it is to this day, it is one of the highest reviewed liqueurs in history, bar none. Wow. wow. International competitions are just fucking crushed. So why have I not seen this at a bar and why have I not tasted this yet? Well it got to I I was up to twenty two states in four countries in 2015. Mm-hmm. And w- you know, you, you get a you get a certain amount of attention and the big boys come for you. The big boys came for me in 2015. Short version is I signed a contract worth millions of dollars to take my brand national and the company reneged. <gasps> <gasps> Yo, dun, dun, dun. Like, but 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 weren't they but, held but, by their contract? Wait. Oh, listen, the person behind the money is one of the biggest food families in the country. Like, you can't fight that battle in court and win. Mm. They can win a battle of attrition against you. You cannot win that battle. 
but and they the, knew that going in. The brand was hot, so I put it back out. They got into a three-way bidding war with three of the biggest liquid, liquid companies on the planet. And this company made a very aggressive bid to me. Looked at their lawyer, looked at looked them in the eye and said, listen, I have paperwork for you in three days. Six months. Six months went by. And then I got an email that said, you know, we're not comfortable. We're backing out. What the fuck? Here's, here's the deal. When I got my license to make liquor in 2012, what I did not know and what I couldn't have known is I was the only black person in America <gasps> with a license to make liquor. Of course. Of fucking So the joke course. I tell right now is, who's been to a zoo? Yep. Who's seen a lion in person? Yep. Who's seen a tiger in person? Yep. Who's seen a bear in person? Mm-hmm. Who's seen a black liquor brand owner in person? Well, now we have. No, nah, now nah, doesn't count. Uh, <laughs> so not even like Jay Z or any of these motherfuckers no, own a liquor brand. They don't own. Okay, so like they have their name. So like they um, have their name attached to it as like a celebrity to a liquor brand. Okay. So like um, P Diddy has his name attached to like Ciroc, Ciroc. but he doesn't actually right. make Ciroc. He doesn't make he, Ciroc. Yeah. He doesn't have any. Um, no creative input. No, no creative <laughs> input. Nah. I've actually talked to the people. Like I've talked to some of the people who. Uh, have the creative input on Ciroc and like who came up with some of my favorite flavors of Ciroc and like they were super lovely people all white yeah yeah all white people what I figured out was the people wanted the brand they didn't want me yep and what is more American than taking black ideas and, and black labor yeah profiting on it and cutting out the individual oh you mean the definition of cultural appropriation? Yeah, pretty much. Everyone agreed. Four or five years, nine-figure exit. Call back to our cultural appropriation episode. Hey, I so, watched that shit, yo. All right. What did you think of our cultural appropriation episode? Because I actually We can go down a lot of tangents. <laughs> yo, we can go on all the tangents. Um, I haven't actually been able... Like, I've had a couple conversations with a few people of color about that episode. But, like, it was also interesting to me because, like... A lot of that episode was me just putting a lot of my research and my own personal thoughts about cultural appropriation out there. Right. And hoping that like one, I wasn't misspeaking and two, that I wasn't like being a bad representation of not only the black community, but of people of color in general. Um, and that also it didn't feel like I was being too militant either because you, that's how could you possibly be too militant on this issue? Because I'm a black woman who can be perceived as angry. Right. But that's their problem, <laughs> not yours. This is, this is a great point though. And, and it's something you've mentioned several times and I have always tried to approach it from the perspective of, I don't understand, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but hearing you push back on that, my instinct is to say, well, who gives a fuck? Like mm. you do you. And I get that I have the privilege of being able to say that because I can do that and I'm not going to get the same kind of repercussions from society that you're going to get. But when it comes to us doing an episode on cultural appropriation, like I want you to feel like you can speak your mind and you can say what you need to say and not worry about well, what, what are the negative repercussions that can result from but that. But see, here's my take, right? We were raised that we had to be taught to be proud of your blackness. Mm -hmm. I'm beyond that now. Proud of my actually, blackness? I was taught not to be proud of my blackness. I was taught to be ashamed of it. Yeah, here's my thing about my blackness. You're welcome. Yep. So All in, that culture, you're welcome. Yep. Jazz, rock and roll, country, R&B, hip hop. Punk. You're welcome. Thanks. Fried yeah, chicken, you're welcome. you're welcome. Yep. Dancing, vernacular, Slang, oh, all everything, -E. all of your culture. I'm black. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question, when you say who gives a fuck, it's really about I want our podcast to be taken seriously. And in order for our podcast to be taken seriously, I have to be very careful about how I present myself, because if I come across as too angry, if I come across as too militant, if I come across as too aggressive, it scares large demographics of people, even people who consider themselves liberal or open minded, because 
society has taught us to not engage with angry black women. And me coming across as an angry black woman, I immediately get shut down. People stop engaging with me, even if they want to listen to what I have to say, even if they want to hear what I have to say. The moment I become aggressive, I stop being a source of information for them. I start being a triggering source Fair for enough. them. Fair enough. That God, makes sense. God that help you if you make some Kamala faces. Yo, when I, <laughs> I thought you, that was received well. Uh, it was received well by women. It was just completely glossed over by most men. A lot of people had issues with her facial expressions. No, but I only see the posit the, saw the positive reaction. The same people who had issues with the faces that Kamala was making are the same men that tell women to smile on the street. Oh, yeah, my favorite kind of men. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you should smile more. And she was sitting there smiling the whole time. She should smile less. So, like, as a black woman, it like she was walking the finest fucking line where yo she dances she, shit like a ballet yo it like i didn't even have to watch it i just saw a gif of like her faces going through and i was like yo first mm -hmm. of all like she was giving auntie vibes like a motherfucker where i was like <laughs> there was a couple faces that she made where i was like i feel like i'm in trouble and i didn't even <laughs> yes. watch the debate yes. like <laughs> Like I saw a couple eyebrows and I was like, "Ooh, he gonna die. Someone's gonna die right. in that whole fucking. Right. Uh, ooh, I need to get out." Like, like I, I, there was one part. There, there was one part where she went, "Let's review the history." Ooh, who child? That's ooh. black woman for you about to die. <laughs> yup. That's that's not even like. Let me teach you something. That's. I'm a fuck you up right now. So who's going to be her anger translator? Who? Like, honestly, honestly, I want her to be her own anger translator. But I is, want her to be that too. So the thing is, what was beautiful about watching her and like, like I said, I didn't watch the debate because like I needed to tend to my own mental health issues and I played Among <laughs> Us instead and it was much more fun. Um, but watching just her faces in the debate, it was very clear that she was walking a razor thin line where she was not allowed to be angry. She was not allowed to show her disdain or displeasure in any capacity because the moment she showed any sort of negative emotions, she would have immediately been perceived as aggressive or angry and been dismissed immediately. Right. But also the way that she was so perfectly corporate in her smiles and like, you could see she was smiling in her mouth, and but thinking, in her eyes, she was murdering him. And that was the kind of look where, like, there were some looks where, like, she was just sitting there like, mm -hmm. yeah, and, like, you could see on her face where she was like, I dare you to say another word. We gonna take this up outside. I will get the chunkla. You want the chunkla? What like, is the chunkla? Oh, uh, that translates to old shoe. That's like you get a sandal thrown at you. Yeah. Like if you catch a chancla. It's not pleasant. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. And for the like, record. If I have to take my shoe off, you going to die today. No, for the record, my mom didn't hit me with a shoe. She threw it. My mom threw a skillet at me. Yo. Because she Caribbean. A That's frying accurate. pan. A, a cast iron skillet. Oh, Yo, oh, first Lord. of all, do you know how much arm strength it takes to toss a cast iron? If I have to pick that shit up and hurl it across the room, you fucked up, child. Well, in all fairness, I had it coming. <laughs> Uh, Look, like I said, like you I have crossed, coming. you've crossed several lines up to the, you've been warned. I, you don't start with a cast iron. No, no, you end no, with no, cast no. Iron. I was 14. We were in a screaming match. I don't remember over what. My <laughs> mom is five for nothing, 98 pounds. Yep. She thought I crossed the line. So she picked up a broom. Try to hit me with a broom. I snatched it from her hands, snapped it over my uh -uh. knee. No, that's how she got that cast iron. at her feet. <gasps> and I said, I said, now what are you going to do? Oh, child. Oh, child. How, how big how, were you at this point? How at you came out alive is a miracle. I, you know, you could uh, not have been small at 14. No, I wasn't small. I, was, I wasn't small. You were bigger you than your five mother. Feet. I, no, I, I was 5'9", I was 5'10". Five, five, right, right. So she had the response. So she picks up a metal folding chair like she was in worldwide wrestling. <laughs> it came at me with a folding chair. I grabbed it, snatched it out of her hands, threw it across the room, and I said, "Now what are you gonna do?" And I, she made that look, that look at me. And here's the mistake I made. 
Here's where I messed up. You turned your back to her, didn't you? No. She was standing in the doorway of the kitchen. Mm-mm. So she didn't break eye contact. She reached back and grabbed the cast iron skillet off of the stove. Information was standing, hurled it in my direction. I watched this thing pass my face, matrix style slow motion, and make a hole in the wall, level with my head. So what you're saying is her accuracy was on fucking point. Uh, it was a warning shot. <laughs> she n- missed on purpose. It was a warning shot, for real. And when I saw the hole, I I took a long walk. I didn't have when I and when I got home, I didn't have the courage to speak for days. I think it was three days later, and I was sitting, sitting at the dinner table, and I was like, "Could you pass the salt?" Ah. That's that's all you got. Just yo, she was ready to kill me. Yo, first of all, you you provoke that woman past the point of I, no return. I, I had it coming. I'm not gonna lie, but I. How are you gonna break a broom? And she's trying to be nice to you at that point. If she has a broom, she's trying to be nice. How to was you. beating me with a broom trying to be nice to because me? Because she could have got the cast iron to start with. Clearly, you her. Are, eight- are you advocating for child's? No, I'm just saying I grew up with a Caribbean mother and I know how that should be. Like, she could have started with the cast iron. She started with the broom and you said, what you going to do now? I provoked her. I had it coming. I admit that. But I I'm lear- just saying. But, like, I, but I learned a valuable lesson. Maybe don't fuck with your mamas. Maybe don't fuck with Caribbean women. They'll kill you. Uh-huh. That's accurate. They'll kill you. Yep. Without a second thought. They'll be mad about it. They, they'll they be mad that they had to kill you. Why did you make me kill you? <laughs> you joke, but I have an ex who killed the boyfriend after me. No. Stabbed him 17 times and got away with it. Yo, how did she get away with that shit? I don't know. She was mad cute. She probably got into the court and flooded her eyebrows. Mm. I don't know. Damn. Well, at least she didn't kill you. But like, this is where like death was a lover that you have had for a very long yeah, time. Death has been a friend of mine for a long time. Because like, literally the boyfriend after you. But also, like. But that's a whole nother story, though. Like, this is the chick, Dominican, right? Mm. We've been dating. This is the first one I dated after my marriage ended. Mm-hmm. Met it in a strip club. Sounds like a terrible life decision, but okay. Yeah, but like... <laughs> and this is coming from a former stripper. Wait, wait, like, wait, wait, wait. I was in a sexless marriage. I was with one person. I was with one person for 10 years. A sexless marriage. So like... I'm that, in, those words to uh, me just sound like hell in a handbasket. I'm working on Wall Street at the time. Lord. And they had this strip club called... Uh, I forget the name. It's not, it, it's not even around anymore, is no, it? No, it was one of the first places Giuliani shut down. Mm-hmm. Harmony Theater. Oh my God! On Wall Street, it was on Canal. It was on Church and Off Canal, and it was so underground, like you only knew about it if you knew about it. Mm-hmm. And that his how you knew it was underground. The hours were noon to midnight. Oh yeah, and like just to be clear for any of our watchers or listeners, strip club hours are usually from six p.m. to four a.m. in New York. So if you have a strip club that closes at midnight, yeah, they're doing massive amounts of money in the day, and yep. that's all the money they're doing. Yep, they don't even bother with nighttime. If they aren't even, like, if you can't even go catch a drink there after midnight, they don't give a fuck about you. Not by midnight, the girls were like, "Listen, I made rent for the night. I'm out." Yep, wrap it up. Let's go. But in the middle of a lap dance, she looked at me and she was like, "You know." You seem like a decent guy. You should call me sometime. And wrote her number on the inside of a Marlboro box. Uh, that sounds like such a 90s ass thing to do. Yo, it was it was the most 90s ass thing to do. But check it, right? We're dating for a year and a half. Okay. Things are actually going good. Mm-hmm. It's the millennium. Uh, and she was she wanted to go home for the holidays, for Christmas and New Year's. Okay. I'm ready the whole week. Before she leaves, we're shopping together. We're buying stuff for the family. We're <coughs> cooking. We're preparing for, for for a trip. Help to pack. I'm with her the night before she goes, and I'm in a bed with me. She's like, "Yo, 
through it all. Al Sima, you mean you to the top. This this is gonna be our year. We're gonna make these things happen. I next morning, driving to the airport, kiss her goodbye. Yo, she was going for six weeks. She, she came home five weeks pregnant. <laughs> like she fell off the plane and landed on somebody's dick. Yep. Because <laughs> like, first of all, first of all, first of all, first of all, like, okay, so I understand like she was going home or what have you, but like. Clearly, she had been in New York for a while. So it's not like she had just like, because like, y'all, you were seeing her for like a year, right? No, she was, she was, she was born in in DR. Right. No, no, no. But I'm saying. Raised in New York. Right. Okay. So like, she had been in New York for a long ass motherfucking time at this point. So like, either one, she had Dick waiting for her in DR, or two, she took the first dick that came along in DR. Or both. Mm, child. When did you start your blog? So, I wrote a blog called Fucking in Brooklyn for a decade. No, excuse me. I wrote it for three years. But I wrote it a decade ago. I started in 2009 after the worst heartbreak of my life. I, you know, I... I I had this thing where so I got question. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But was the worst heartbreak of your life your divorce or was no, it- no, 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 no? <laughs> okay. Divorce was the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my marriage was a disaster. Yeah, I was gonna say like I needed nah, to clarify that just nah. for like people listening at home because like a lot of people would assume that like the like breaking up of a marriage is like the worst nah, thing that can happen. Divorce but divorce like- was divorce was great. <laughs> Did you have a party afterwards? I was Did you hom- consider it? I was homeless for three months afterwards. Okay. All right. Which is not a party. No, that's not a party. I I met Liz at uh, 20. Knew her for a year. Dated for four years. Engaged for a year. Married for four years. A month into being married, she became physically abusive. In four years of marriage, I was punched, kicked in my face. She'd break my shit. Wow. And Christmas Eve, 1997, you know, I've been sleep. I, I had been sleeping on the couch for six months. We'd been in therapy for eight months. She comes to me and she goes, you need to find someone to spend, spend the night on Christmas Eve. What the fuck? So I slept in my car. I come back two days later and I go, I am not happy. And, yeah, this, and mean- this is not what I thought married life was going to be like. It's not how I want to spend the rest of my life. And I'm only here right now having this conversation out of a sense of greater moral obligation because we stood in front of God and witnesses and we said, I do. And I don't want to do this anymore. And she looked at me and she said, if that's how you really feel, you can get yourself and get the hell out right now. Okay. And I got a hefty bag and a laundry bag in the closet. I could carry it and I was gone. I was gone. So no, my marriage, my marriage ending was the best thing that ever happened to me. That was not the worst heartbreak of my life. The worst heartbreak of my life was a full decade after. Wow. And that is what led you to writing the blog. So here's the thing: when I, when my marriage ended, I really wanted to catch up on all the sex that I hadn't been having. Yep. I was gonna say, like, and if it you was were in like, a sexless marriage. It was for like that 1998 long. in New York City, and I was an underwear model. I oh was like, God. "How much catching up can I do?" Okay, so but the question is, like, do you still have some pictures? Because like, I would happily link some pictures of you from I, the 90s. I, listen, I because like, I, just to be clear, in present day, you look you're in really fucking great shape. So like, you in the 90s, like. I post for, I post for Playgirl was never published. Mm. It wasn't published because it after I saw the pictures, I was like, I can never have my mom find out about this. Yeah. And not that my mom meets Playgirl, but she would know she would have known. First of all, it's a Caribbean woman. Of course she would have motherfucking known. She would have found out. Do you know how deep that grapevine goes? Like I go down to Belize once and like as I'm leaving Belize, the woman who's checking my passport as I'm leaving Belize looks at my last name and goes, oh, are you from Belize? And I was like, no, but my family is. This is my first time in the country. She's like, oh, I know your family. They're good people. Beautiful. Big family. And I'm like, son of a 
fuck. I can't be nowhere in nah. this country. Nah, my, my <laughs> mom is force sensitive. If if I just if, if it had been published, I'd have got I'd have went to visit and she'd have been she'd have been, what did you do, my son? Yo. I sense a disturbance <laughs> in the force. <laughs> I, I so yes, I will send you those pictures. They're tasteful. Perfect. We'll put them up um, on the um we'll put them up on the blog. But yeah, I in the in ten years between 30 and 40, I went on about 2,000 dates. Wow. Yo, make up for lost time. Yo, uh, I didn't have I didn't have 2,000 partners, to be clear. Okay. Um, for 2,000 dates, that's a lot of work. Yo, I had a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night date. I took Fridays off to hang out with my cat. <laughs> that's a lot of money. And then, No, it's not. Here's the thing, right? All right. I figured it out. Teach a kid over here. Because this is like the baby dating. Dessert right here. date is the deal. Ooh, dessert dates are great. No one says no to dessert. That's accurate. It's low commitment. Uh huh. Everyone likes dessert. That's, and it I'm in a better not, mood when you. It does not cost put, you a lot of money. Yep. I had one spot, La Lanterna de Vittorio. It's on McDougal <laughs> wait, or, wait. or for West Third. And you took every girl to the same spot? I, mean, I went on a thousand first dates at this same spot. Yes. And they knew you. And well, they were like, here I, wait, comes Jack from wait, Brooklyn with I, another girl. I had been going this since I was 13. Oh, my The owner God. was a buddy of mine. Vito, uh, Vittorio knew me. Uh, so, like, I would cut. <laughs> and he always knew. Like, I'd walk in and meet Jack. How are you? What's your after tonight? I was like, Vito, I always have the same thing. I get pecan pie. With a scoop of ice cream and hot apple cider. And you go, no, Jack, what you had? Blonde, brunette, redhead? <laughs> I'll never forget. There was this one time I was at uh, La Lantana de Vittorio. It's been there for ages. And I'm with this woman. We're having a nice time. And she says to me, how do you know this place? And I go, oh, I've been coming here since I was 13. And she goes, this is your first day place, isn't it? You take all your uh, first. You take all your first dates here, don't you? <laughs> Yo, and why I, is she about that jealousy wow, like that? Fucking but still, she called it out that quick. I mean, but, look, but check it. I said the proprietor's sitting right here. Why don't you ask him? And Vito was sitting right there. So she taps us. She taps him on the phone. She goes, "Excuse me, excuse me. Are you the owner of this establishment?" And Vito, he's this statuesque, yeah, older Italian gentleman, like a lifetime of. Stinky cheese and air dried meats and lots of red wine. Yes, uh, how may I be of service to you? And he, without looking at me, she points at me. And she goes, "Do you know this man?" Oh yes, Jack. I've known him for many years. The he be all of his first dates here? And he looks at her, looks at me, and he goes, "I must admit, Jack has brought many, many women here." But you are by far the most beautiful. Uh, Yo, I can't stand it. Let's talk about the perfect same. fucking women right now. Good Yo, save, Vito. You know what? Honestly, I appreciate this man. This man deserves an extra <laughs> bottle of wine and a round of applause. That is a beautiful save. Like, yo, all right. You know what? I got to give it to him. But yeah, in a, from 30 to 40, I went on at least 2000 dates and then I and that was like pre-dating app so like how did you find all of these women this is new york city you kidding me beautiful women are everywhere okay but that's accurate but how did you get these beautiful women to talk to you because like as a woman that's like trying to talk to these beautiful women and like if you're listening and you're a pretty girl can you please holler at me <laughs> but like how do you get these pretty women to like stop and talk to you besides being super hot because like I, I would like to know your secrets i don't and have, i'm sure john would appreciate them too i do not have a predatory aura oh i don't either but that's i just that's what that, I, that's that, what that's, that's my problem. I come off as really predatory. That's all it is. <laughs> I. But like, okay, maybe it's just the problem that like, it's the like bisexual problem where it's like, I don't know if a woman is flirting with me or not. And like, like it, the other day I was actually on a date with this lovely non-binary person and um, they and I were hanging out and we're by Central Park and this woman walks up to us and was like, hey, can you give me bike directions? Like I need like and like we're all on our like we're both on our bikes and like we're about to take a like bike ride around Central Park because it's COVID out. And that's like the kind of date that you have in COVID. And um, she was like, hey, can you give me directions on like how to get down to the West or like the East Village um, via bike routes? And I was 
I've been biking the city for seven years at this point. So I was like, oh, yeah, I can absolutely tell you what you're going to do is you're going to go down this street. You're going to take a left. You're going to go straight down Second Avenue. It'll take you perfectly there. Blah, blah, blah. Right. 40 minutes later, she's still chatting us up and like is like talking about how, oh, you know, like before the world broke, I like had this favorite gay bar where we'd sing show tunes and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, I personally don't like show tunes, but like I appreciate this bar and like the fact that they have a live piano and like lots of like drag queens and like the show, like the show tunes gays come in and like belt their hearts out. I am not one of those gays, but like I appreciate that kind hey. of I would hang out at that bar and have some drinks and like enjoy my time. But like she was like, we should be Facebook friends. And I'm like, I don't give my Facebook out to strangers. Like I might give you my IG, but like my Facebook's like that's real personal. And like it took until like the last 10 minutes of this conversation for me to realize that she had been hitting on me this entire time and like was like occasionally talking to my date but my date was like is this bitch trying to fucking steal my date right now but you know what like we're both poly so like my date was like you know what i'm a wingman this and i was like what are what is happening so maybe it's just that i'm just unaware and unobservant and if you're into me and i don't know it please slide into my dms where were you meeting most of these women Everywhere you walk down the street in New York City is full of women. So it was like a full time job for you that when you saw a beautiful woman, it, a beautiful it, woman, you reached out to them, you connected with them, you it, asked for their number. It wasn't as much. It was. It wasn't as much a full time job. It was like, I'm here and I'm alive. Why should I pass up on this opportunity? You know, what are like the logistics of it? You're like you asked them for the number. Like how 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 did that work? Are you in giving that era? your number out to them? There was no Instagram. There was no smartphone. Like like what are we talking about? It's, meeting women if you are not an asshole is. The, easiest thing no, to do it's one thing to meet somebody though but like how are you making connections how are you getting there like going on a date with them like what how did how did you work so, out the logistics how did you even find out how to get to a place when they didn't have gps like like what era are we talking about here what year was this like the 90s. this is not that difficult <laughs> the 90s, early 2000s. this is not that difficult like, i mean but also if you know new york city and you're born and raised in new york city it's pretty that easy, was a like, joke so, so, how so, do you do the logistics so I'll, 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 I'll give you two examples off the top of my head i'll yeah. never I, I was Coming home from hanging out with my niece, and I was at uh, West Forest Station, and I see this woman, and she's beautiful. And I walk up to her and I say, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt. I know you're busy. You're beautiful. I'd love to get to know you. Can you please give me a number? We'll talk later. I'm here with my niece, and I can't talk right now. She gives me her number, right? I get to work because I'm working night shift, and I realize that she's giving me Six of seven digits. Yeah. So I dialed ten times. Forty six different numbers. Wow. Before I got her number right. And she was like, Hey, what's going on? What took you so long? I was like, Okay, what's going on? How you feel? So it wasn't intentional. She was No, it was like it was it was it was completely accidental, but like it was easy. Hi, my name is Jack. I want to get to know you. Here's here's another example. And this one actually changed everything for me. This has got to be like 2002 or three. Okay. I'm walking down Fifth Avenue in the 50s. This woman barrels out of sacks with shopping bags in both hands, almost knocks me over. And I catch just a glimpse of her eyes over, under her, over her oversized sunglasses. She has aquamarine eyes. And like I could hear the music going off in my head. I could hear the drums. So I do the thing that you're never supposed to do. I run down the street and I catch up to her. And I go, listen, I, I, excuse me. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disturb you. I know you're busy. I know you're carrying stuff. You just came out of sacks. You almost knocked me over. I need, I need to know if you're in love with anybody right now. I said, I, you're, obviously you're dating somebody or somebody thinks you're dating you. But if you're not in love with somebody i need to talk to you give me your phone number she looked at me 917 <laughs> yo <laughs> honestly you know what i appreciate that game like that's the strongest game i think i've ever heard like are you in love with somebody right now because like it's one thing to be like where your man at 
Is he strong? Is he big? Is he coming back? Is he gonna get you Mike and Ike's? But but let me let me tell you the rest of the story just so I can just, just so I can tell you how that went. Cause yeah, because it, it changed me, right? Mm-hmm. She was beautiful and smart and uh, nimbly aerobic. Hey, and thoroughly uninteresting. <laughs> oh. Do you she, ever feel bad? When you, you go to all that effort, you make somebody feel like this is a really special thing. Because what you're doing is special. You're giving them a special experience. And then let, they end up being uninteresting. And then what do you do? You just walk. Let me, tell you, let, me, let me tell you how it played out, right? So she was a buyer for one of the major retailers in New York. And, like, she was legit smart. But all she ever, all she ever wanted to talk about was shopping. Oh, my God. That's so infuriating. And I was like. I, like, I. Literally, like my brain has already shut like, off talking it, about the idea of talking about shopping. If I had been a vet with tinnitus, it had been a perfect relationship. Mm, um, yep. But listening to her talk made me want to stab myself in the eardrums. Mm-hmm. And again, I was picking the eardrums. It, it, yeah. She was a good person. She was a she was a Lovely sweet human. person. Mm-hmm. But like I. The comp a ninety nine percent of a conversation was centered around shopping, and I it was so uninteresting for me. And I'll never forget we were in bed one night after several hours of aerobics, and she starts talking about this shoe sale that's about to happen. It's two o'clock in the morning, yo, and she's going on and on, and, and like I did one of these. <sighs> And she looked at me. It's two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And she goes, am I boring you? Yes. The actual answer is yes. You're fucking boring the shit out of me. I said, no, please continue with the blathering blather sky. Yep. How'd that play out? Well, her mouth was open, but there was no sound coming out. Because like, what do you say to that? So it, it ended. Shocking. Uh, but you know, she was still legitimately a sweet person. And she came, she asked me a few weeks, a few weeks after it ended, like what went wrong? And I was honest with those. I said to her, listen, you're an amazing person, but you're not for me. From the moment I saw you, like I heard drums, I hear them right now. And everything in my loins is telling me that I should be not walk you, away yeah. from you but i need more than percussion i want horns and strings and I want the whole orchestration orchestra. i want sort of voce and allegro and i want to fly to the edge of the stratosphere and fall to earth and you're gonna make someone really happy but it's it's not me mm-hmm. and it was like Holy shit, I've just ruined myself. <laughs> Cause now I can't go back to anything less than everything. Yeah. And everything walked into my life at 40 years old. Wow. Like that woman that just hit every single part of my intellect and my spirit and my humor and my creativity and my soul and my set. That person walked into my life. And completely broke my heart. And right away? No, not right away. Uh, it took a while. How long were you together? We were, we were together for like six months. Okay. But it wasn't the time. It was the intensity. Yes, that makes sense. Because we were talking eight hours a day. Yeah, and you were, we were like talking eight constantly. hours a day. We were fucking eight hours a day. So you were together 16 hours a day? Pretty much. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't talk while you're having sex? They're mutually exclusive? Depends on the sex. Depends on what you're doing. I mean, you talk through kinky stuff. You don't talk through fucking most of the time. At least you I, don't have, like, full conversations. No, it's, it's more directional. Like, lift your leg. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. To the right. To the right. To the right. Ah, uh, right there. Uh, but the last conversation we ever had, she said to me, you are everything, everything, everything I've ever wanted in a man. I don't know if I'm making the worst mistake of my life. 
And the only thing I could say to her was, I hope you're making the best decision for both of us. And I was more broken than I'd ever been in my whole life. Did she ever explain why? She never explained why, but I knew why. The short version is uh, her mom left her dad when she was young. So she had uh, the opposite of an Oedipus complex. Mm. There's a there's a there's a term for it and I can't think of it at the moment because rum. Hey, good rum does that to you. But her greatest fear was doing to her dad what her mom did to her dad. And when she realized she was falling with me, she became her mom and I became her dad. Oh, no. And it was just she couldn't break out of the cycle. And then she ended up completing the cycle by breaking up with you. Here's here's the crazy part. And again, I wrote a blog called fucking in Brooklyn. This isn't anywhere in, in any of my great fucking stories. So the day the last day we ever spoke, what she didn't realize is that that day. I had gone to a stationery store and I bought fancy stationery. With fancy envelopes. And I bought a deck of cards. And I bought a fountain pen with ink. She ends things. And the next day, I take out the deck of cards. I shuffle it. I pull one card. I look up online what the card means. And then I write her a letter. 52 cards. 52 letters. I write a letter a week for a year. She never responds. Wow. Wow. So you wrote her longer than you dated her. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we had known each other for years. Okay. But we... Ugh, again, lo- to make a long story short, when we met... MySpace was still a thing. Like it's wow. that it's that yeah. long ago. Oh, and I'm... she was living in Saudi Arabia. Wow. And uh the sheik she was working for gave her a Rolex, which is chic for you about to be part of the harem, prepare yourself. Uh, yep. So she did the only thing she could do and she vanished. She left her life in Saudi Arabia behind and moved to Canada where she had family. Mm-hmm. And when she got to fam, when she got to Canada, she started talking to me again. And I was like, you know, we have this thing in North America called phones. We can talk on the phone. Yeah, like it's a possibility. And the first time we took the phone, we talked for like fourteen hours, and it was like that. It was a complete connection of mind and soul and body. But when things ended with her, after the year of writing letters. I decided I was going to write about the progress as a human being from being the guy that got divorced to the guy that wanted to fuck a lot, to the guy that realized fucking a lot wasn't going to be enough for me, to the guy that found everything he wanted and lost it. Like, it's a it's a real narrative. But also... You lost it through no fault of your own. But you can lose things through no fault of your own. Oh, though. of course. But it, was, it wasn't it was like you had done anything particularly wrong in the relationship or that like the relationship had gone sour in any capacity. She was just terrified of her own. But that's the thing that's hard to, future. that's the thing that's hard to, to, for people to accept because you can do everything right and it can still go sideways. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah. I mean, love is hard. Love is hard. And it's, it's, it's such a truth that, you know, it's like going out and meeting a ton of people. That's the easy part. It's like finding, finding the ones that really make you happy, really make you tick that you can really connect with. That's, it's like I such have, a lottery, right? I have been to the edge of the stratosphere. <laughs> I have made love with Valkyries. I have made love with the most, I mean, I've had them. I've been extremely fortunate. I've had the most amazing woman in my life. But I reached a point where if I can't have everything, I'd rather have nothing. Wow. 
And yo, 2020 has been a lot of nothing. It's been a lot of nothing. Speaking of like 2020 bullshit, like I know you've been on a lot of Zoom calls on 2020. Oh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) I mean, I was going to say it's just you and Bowie now. Yo, um, my cat is amazing. Uh, you got one of the cutest cats I think I've ever fucking I don't seen. Know if cute covers it. That's that's it. That's this one is gorgeous a, kitty. This is a model kitty. Like this is like the creme de la creme of the kitties. But you know he's a rescue. Kitty? You know he's a rescue though, right? That's amazing. Oh. How long did he live on the street? At least a year. Wow. At least a year. He was a rescue when I when the day that he was pulled off. He I, first of all, he's he is his breed is Calmanay. Which if you, they've been in Thailand for a thousand years. They've mm-hmm. only been in North America for the last 30. If you tried to buy him as a kid, they're like 10,000 bucks. Wow. I had So a, you got a $10,000 cat for free. Well, it, like I had a friend in Madison, Wisconsin of all places. Of course. Who saw him on the street not doing well and, and brought him in and she couldn't keep him mm-hmm. because she had two dogs and two cats and they were all beating him up oh no because he was and the, she like, reached lunch. out to me and she was like yo do you I have want him yeah and i was like yeah give me yes i'm in new orleans working but i'm a finish work i'm a fly to new york drop my shit off fly to wisconsin and, and come catch this cat get this cat get him his shots get him his papers bring him back to brooklyn now, now he knows he's a Brooklyn kid. Oh, he is the most Brooklyn ass cat. <laughs> Yo, like you put him in some Tim's in a fitted. Yeah. Like he's a Brooklyn ass cat. Yo, when I bring home jerk chicken, he's like, Yo, what's that? I'm like, Yo, he be this knowing. Is not, it's not cat food. But yo, he be knowing though. He knows. <laughs> he knows. He's about that life. He's about the life. Yo, and he is so fucking beautiful with his two different color eyes. And like somehow they're both the brightest, most vivid colors, too. How dare you get the most model ass kitty? But he knows he's he knows he's pretty. He knows he's too cute. He knows he's pretty. I've seen this cat in person and like this cat knows he's cute. Like he can recognize himself in a front facing camera. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he is ready for his close up. He's like. He knows how to do a selfie. Yo, he when does. he poses, yo, you would think that he was on a cat food commercial the way that he poses. He We're knows. absolutely going to post pictures of Bowie because it is, far, it would be a crime for us to be interviewing Jackie and not have us post pictures he of totally Bowie. Knows. Like, wow, he totally knows. Wow, this cat knows. is too cute. So you've turned into a cat man. I've always been a cat man. I've had cats since I was a little kid. Okay. Um, I don't trust people who aren't cat people. I'm not going to lie. I don't trust people who don't like animals in general. Okay, that's fair. If you don't like animals in general, like, you might be a sociopath. You're definitely a sociopath. (laughs) Like, big indicator. But, like, I also, like, I'm weird because, like, dog people, like, people who are, like, super into dogs, like, I get the appeal of dogs. Dogs are super cute. And, like, I love playing with dogs. And, like, I love hanging out with dogs. Do I want a dog? No. No. Because I don't want a permanent toddler. But cats... Cats feel like having like a permanent like seven or eight year old. They're just smart enough that they can be kind of independent, but just dumb enough that they are hilarious. And they're also just smart enough that they can have the most ridiculous attitudes. Yeah. And like, oh, they're so prissy. And it's so funny. And it will never not be old to me. Like they're such assholes of animals and they are my favorite. Like I'm the biggest... I would be that crazy cat lady that has like 15 very well behaved cats that all get along. And like I have a whole like cat like room that has like cat towers and like shit on the wall. Yeah, no, that would be like my dream. Like if I had like a mansion, I would have like a wing dedicated to like the cat wing. But like cats would be all across the house. They would. I'd have like a whole set of uh, people that I would pay to help me take care of just like cleaning the litter boxes. (laughs) <laughs> or, you, or, or you could do what one woman did and just have one room that is litter box. No, oh, no, Jesus I would not. Christ. No, I absolutely would not because that's the a hard smell, pass for me. The smell would take up the entire mansion. That's not how I live my life. That's a hoarder, and I'm not. No, but like I'd get a bunch of automatic litter boxes, but they would all just need to be changed like every day. Right. Tell us about the Garden of Infinite Fucks. So, my first book is coming out next year. Uh, and it will be an illustrated parable for adults, and it's called 
the Garden of Infinite Fox, and it is a modern day story for social justice fatigue. Yo, that is fucking real. Because, I mean, like, think it, about what everyone said when RGB died. Yep. Fuck. Fuck. Uh, fuck, 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 fuck. Like, and the question is, what happens when you run out of fucks? Yep. So the Guard of Infinite Fucks is about a student who goes to the teacher and, and, and says, I don't know what to do anymore. Like, I have given everything I have. I have no fucks left to give. And the teacher goes, you can't run out of fucks. Fucks mean you care. Your problem is not possession. Your problem is allocation. You don't know how to allocate your fucks. You need to learn when to stay in your fucking lane. Mm-hmm. And he put the, the teacher points to the garden because they're chilling in the garden. And he goes, imagine all of my flowers are fucks that I've cultivated. Everything here shows that I care. Mm-hmm. But I don't waste my fucks on nonsense. And he plucks a flower and he gives it to the, to the student and he goes, this is for you. Because I have only one fuck to give for you today. I don't waste my fucks on bullshit. I have nary a fuck to waste. Yep. That deserves a round of a fucking applause. Amen. Amen. That's so good. I, I want to hear about your favorite rums. You, you all, of, all of them. You have <laughs> rum. All of them. You have had an opportunity in this lifetime. You have had some great to taste rums. some rum. Maybe some rums I've never tasted. What, what is what would have been would have been the highlights? So rum is complicated in that rum comes from places where cane sugar grows naturally and that's this mm. narrow band around the equator yeah. and in a general sense only brown people black people live in that particular spaces whether it's the caribbean or polynesia or india and pirates i mean well i mean they had five pirates of the caribbean movies and no black people so which i mean what is the accuracy of that because how are they pirates of the caribbean hello and not a single Caribbean person, except for Callisto, which was one of the bad people in the fucking movie. Hello. Which, okay, let's talk about the whitewashing there. How you gonna make a black woman with dreads and a Caribbean accent the bad guy in a Caribbean movie? Hello. Hello. But, but that's another that's a whole nother bucket. You see, yeah. I the, just want to hear about some rum. The problem, my problem with rum is that there is none. They have been <laughs> Folks that look like me working in cane fields for centuries. Mm -hmm. And there aren't folks that look like me that actually own rum brands. Yep. So while I, in a very general sense, enjoy rum because it was raised on, I was raised on it like mother's milk. Mm -hmm. I'm particular about the rums I drink now because I want to know where the rum comes from and who owns the rum and what percentage of uh, people who are working for the brand have an, an equity stake. Mm -hmm. I, I need to know more now. So I, my, I hate to be socially responsible about drinking because I just want drinking to be drinking. But, but everything is, everything requires a modicum of social responsibility. Everything's got a little bit of blood on their hands. Yeah. And colonization touched Everything. And so, what rums? And, and, what, what rums do you do you recommend then? Well, I mean, tonight I'm drinking. Thanks to y'all, I'm drinking Plantation. And for the record, mm -hmm. they're a client. Mm. Got them to agree to change the name. Oh, nice. Oh yeah. Because I like honestly, they, the biggest issue that I have had with Plantation Rum is the is fact the that it's fucking name. How? Why are you gonna make a black person buy shit called plantation? Yo, I will tell you that they came to me in June after the whole Black Lives Matter thing, and mm -hmm. they say we need to do some rebrand. stuff. What should we do? Well, they want they don't want to, they don't want to just rebrand. They're serious about from the ground up doing diversity training. Mm -hmm. And my response was, you could do the training, but until you change the name of your brand, I mean, what's the point? Having a rum called Plantation, yeah, it's like having a nice Jewish wine called Auschwitz. <laughs> yep, 
Yep. There's literally no difference. And like, so it, you know, they, they, they've officially agreed that they're changing their name. They don't know to what yet. And, you know, it's like being in a freighter and trying to turn around in the ocean. Like it takes time. It is, there there are things in production. Mm -hmm. They've got legal worldwide trademarks to clear. They've got to throw out tons of bottles and tons of labels and get all the new stuff printed up. And, and, but yes, like I'm just baffled. Like that tells me right there that there was literally no people of color in the decision making boardroom when they green lighted the name of this rum because any brown person would have been like, You're calling it what now? Yeah. But well, this is why representation matters so much in terms of corporations, in terms of, you know, all kinds of jobs, because when people are making these decisions, if they're not exposed to people who have been through other experiences in life, they're able to make stupid decisions like naming a rum plantation. Yeah, rum. but here's the thing. They'll, the people will tell you we have 100 people of color working for us. They won't tell you that they're working in the cane fields. Right. Yep. They're not working in the design in the design, and they're not working in the logo, the branding, any right. of that stuff. Right, and that's stuff. why yeah. I said like on the board specifically right. because right. if anyone – You need decision makers. If you were – if any person of color was in that decision-making room, they would have right. been like, um, I'm well, just – Why gonna, don't we just call that Jim Crow rum? Yeah, I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, are we Are we selling this in America? Okay. Uh, are we selling this anywhere in the crib? Okay. Let's uh, call. Maybe- let's call the rum strange fruit. Has yeah. the Has Ooh. the name hurt their brand? No. I mean, no, because this country doesn't care about hurting black people. So it's interesting because, like, but in the black community, I would say like there have been times where like, so I recognize that plantation is good rum. Like they actually make quality rum, and yeah. like their rum is really delicious. Right now we're drinking their pineapple rum. Fuck which yes. It's the first time I've ever actually found pineapple rum. And like, oh my God, it's fucking great. But at the same time, like I looked at that bottle and I was like, ugh. Yeah. And you're making me pay more than $20 for this bottle that says plantation. Like, I don't even want to show this off to people because like, fuck, like this hurts me on a visceral level. But like it's good rum and all the other options that I normally would have gone to weren't available at this particular liquor store when I went to buy it. So I was like, all right, well, I mean, I want to try pineapple rum, but like ah it it was one of the strangest moments because like i was absolutely 100 percent conflicted it's conflicting this fucking yes rum. it's conflicting so what kind of name would be more appropriate have they have they talked to you at all about a name west indies rum mm-hmm. it's easy i mean the, the west indies name is interesting though i mean that that's a that's a colonial thing right but people would actually understand and it wouldn't actually be directly tied to the enslavement of people of color. Absolutely. What name is more appropriate though than West Indies? I mean, because that that's a name given by Europeans thinking that they were in India. You could call it anything. You could call it Vivica rum as far as I'm concerned. I like and I'd Vivica be fine rum. with I mean, that. I'm, I I could roll I, with that. I, right? I, 100% approve of this and yeah. if you just want to name a rum after me, I'm really cute and I'll happily be on the bottle. Hey. <laughs> like you, you can, can be a put, bottle girl. You can just put my tits on the bottle. I mean, you got Sailor, Sailor Jerry's and like the girl on the Sailor Jerry's bottle isn't half as cute and her tits are not as great as mine. I mean, so she's like, all right. She's all right. She's but all like right. you put me in that swimsuit and I'll rock your so, whole so, world. So let's talk about why you would make not good. that I'm like up my own ass or anything. I promise I'm Let, not. Let's talk about why you would make a good rum. What makes a good rum? Oh, OK. So a great rum for me has a really great sipping quality. Like you can yes. sip it. Um, both neat and on ice yes. without like too much smoky because like you don't want it to be overly smoked like a uh, whiskey or a uh, single malt scotch. But then at the same time, like it is supposed to be derived from sugar cane. So there has to be a little bit of sweetness behind it. Um, so that like, if you're putting it into a cocktail, it mixes and blends perfectly with any juices you're putting it with without overpowering any of those things. But also like it's not it shouldn't have too much of a bite and it shouldn't have too much. uh, It shouldn't be overly spiced. And so it's one of the reasons why I actually don't really like Kraken. Yeah, because I find that Kraken has too much spice and I won't drink Captain Morgan's um, anymore either. Like if 
the if a buy if I go to a bar and they only have Captain Morgan's as their dark rum, I'm like, okay, cool. Can I get a, a Tito's and cranberry? Because like, I guess I'm not drinking rum tonight. Do you like aged rums? Uh, yes, but like the way that certain rums are aged, um, will occionally have them be closer to single malt scotches. And Meaning they get kind of smoky. They, they get kind get, of peaty. They get kind of smoky, kind of peaty. And like, I am a single malt scotch girl. Like, I fucking love myself a single malt. So like, I'm not going to sit here and like knock that in any capacity. But if I'm drinking rum, that's not what I'm looking for. So this is going to sound like flirting, but it's not. Here's, here's why you would make a good rum. A good rum should be full bodied. Mm-hmm. A good rum should be gently aged. A good rum should be strong and still gentle. A good rum should be able to knock you on your ass. But before you get to the point, you're going to feel so good about life. A good rum should have a little bit of sweetness, but not too much. A good rum should make you know that it deserves your respect. Like, you could enjoy this. But do not fuck with this. A good rum should have a fair amount of funk. Just Mm -hmm. straight up pure funk. At the same time, like, the second you nose it, you should know that you're in love. Uh, You just, like, you smell it and you're just, like, it melts you just a little bit, like, you like feel your whole body relax yeah. a little bit and you're not just like, Oh yeah, no, I mean, uh, okay. So Accurate? like I, I would make a really great rum um, is what I'm hearing. I think we just got a taste of uh, <laughs> how Jackie got 2000 dates in a decade. <laughs> cause, Look. cause I can understand. Yo, <laughs> that was laying it down. That was delightful. Well played, sir. That was well delightful. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> We just got ourselves a highlight clip right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So now you make hot sauce. What, what, what started that? There's a legend in my family that my mother has told me from the time I was a child about how her mother would make hot sauce so hot the bottles would explode. Oh, okay. And we always thought this was hyperbole. Mm. Oh, no, don't tell me you made a bottle explode from heat. Well, here's the thing. My sister has a house out in the Hamptons, Mm -hmm. and she's growing scotch bonnet peppers in her backyard. Don't do it. Okay, all right. Have you ever had a scotch bonnet pepper? No, because I don't like shit that spicy. Oh, my God. I know better. Oh, how many Scoville? I'm not out here eating Well, the the yellow ones start at 100,000 on the Scoville scale, which is a thousand times as hot as a jalapeno. The orange and red ones are 250,000 on the scale. I'm working with the chocolate scotch bonnet, which are 500,000 on the Scoville scale. It's half a million Scoville units. Do, do, do those units appreciably differ between like 100,000 and 500,000? Absolutely. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're talking 10 times a jalapeno. And when uh, talking, jalapeno is not super hot, but 10 times is a lot. The difference between 100,000 and 500,000 units is the difference between standing in front of a fireplace and being on fire. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to say those are just like slightly so, different. So what's, a little bit. What, is, so, what is the, why would someone, why would you want to feel like you're on fire? But here's the thing, right? So my sister's growing these peppers in her backyard. She gives me a, a whole bunch full. And I, because I want to honor my ancestors, decide I'm going to teach myself to make hot sauce. So, There are two ways you do this. You can either do it fresh, which is delicious, but not as good as it could be. Or you can ferment the elements. So right now at home, I've got three jars with either mango, pineapple or or, or mango, pineapple or papaya. Papaya. Thank you. Fermenting with. Sweet peppers, scotch bonnets, uh, onions, excuse me, scouts, shallots, and garlic. 
Oh, it's fermenting so in a 2% brine. Mm -hmm. It will do this for a week. And then at the end of the week, I will take it out of the brine and paint with flavor. Ooh. So you start with the base of the fruit mm -hmm. because that is going to make up the majority of the volume of your hot sauce. And it's already infused with heat. So it's already spiced. Yes, but okay. not, not spice that you can't eat. It's okay. just infused with heat. Then you add the sweet peppers to, again, for volume and flavor. You add the garlic, you add the, the shallots, and then you slowly add the chocolate scotch bonnets so that you can raise the heat incrementally. So you're not it. going straight up 500,000 school oh, bills into the, who into the, the jar. Who the fuck wants your mouth on fire? I okay. mean, okay. no. I mean, okay, no. so like my grandmother who I grew up with, who I also refer to as my mother, um, she would occasionally make her own hot sauce as well because she found that like the hottest hot sauces weren't ever hot enough for her. And this is a woman who was like eating habanero sauce Oof. and like sitting here talking about it's not hot enough. That's bitch, where I draw the line. Bitch, habaneros get me. Oof. Like you're eating habaneros and you're talking about it's not hot. She was like making ghost pepper sauce. And so, I was like, so, so really? here's the thing. You have to learn how to put the heat in the back. Mm hmm. Everybody likes it from the back. Yeah. The first thing that you get when you taste my hot sauce is the flavor of the fruit. There's always, I always finish it with a little bit of aged balsamic vinaigrette. So there's a deep acidic note right in the middle. But the heat, the heat is hidden in the back. So you'll taste it and you'll go, oh, that wasn't hot. But it sneaks up on you. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, oh, so I'm going to get some milk real quick. Yeah. Because my mouth is on fire and there's, I didn't expect it. There's a new sensation on YouTube called Hot Ones. I don't know if you guys have come across this. It's it's a, it's a one of these stupid interview TV shows where they have some stupid celebrity on and they ask them questions. But they had the genius idea of doing it with hot wings. And every, I've seen this. every question, you eat a wing. And it starts at like a thousand Scoville and it goes up to like 500,000 Scoville. So by the end, they're eating a wing that's made with a hot sauce that is rated at 500,000 Scoville level, like the chocolate scotch, scotch bonnets. And it is, it's somehow just so engaging to watch these celebrities just break down as they're trying to answer the questions, but they are just dying. So there's two secrets to that. Yeah. The first secret is you have to consume this without getting it on your lips. Oh. Mm. Because you have all of the pain sensors on your lips oh. that you do inside your mouth, but without the taste. Oh my God. Key and Peel just did it recently. It was the funniest, so funniest if you get, shit I've ever if you seen. Get any of that wait, stuff, were they on there together? They were on there together. Oh my God, you have to send it me was, a link to this because yeah, it, I fucking love Key and Peel. Unreal. When, I'm you, when with you're them. tasting these hot things, put it entirely inside your mouth without getting it on your lips. You have some experience with that. Hey. <laughs> How are you going to call me out like this right now, Jackie? Like, we Are we talking about hot sauce right now? Yes. I came here yes. to have fun and yes. have we're, a good time. We're talking about hot sauce. I did not sauce. come here to be called out like this. Don't get it on your lips because you can't kill the burn. You know right? what? Put it entirely inside your mouth. That's, that's number one. Number two is a combination of citrus or milk actually sits on your palate to kill it. Citrus kills it faster, but citrus doesn't sit on your palate. Milk sits on your palate and kills it. So number one, don't get it on your lips. Number two, do a chaser with something that will actually kill the heat because you're getting the sensation of actually physically being on fire. Mm -hmm. And that works until you're around a bunch of men who are like, oh, you're a pussy. Don't drink the milk. Oh, Which happens every episode. Yeah, who the fuck listens to that toxic oh, shit anyway? No, they yeah. bring it in themselves. Yeah. Every single man on that show is like, I'm not going to drink anything. I'm going to eat these wings like a man. It's oh, really entertaining. Yeah. Even Natalie Portman, like even the women have this weird like yeah, competitive streak when it comes okay, to like, so, like. I'm super competitive, but I know my fucking limits. And that's one thing about like knowing your goddamn boundaries and like being able to express your boundaries and like also not giving into toxic masculinity no matter what your gender. Because like. 
I'm not going to say like, I will happily compete with men. And like, there are plenty of uh, avenues that I will happily hand men their asses. Like you come play buck hunter with me and I will make you fucking cry. I, unless you're like, are you an expert at buck hunter? I am really fucking good at buck hunter. There are very few people in New York city that can actually beat me at buck hunter. And I know every single one of them by name. Are you a redneck? Like buck no. hunter? Okay, first of all, I don't need you coming at me like that. Uh, I'm just, I'm just like, like you this, is, this is a whole new side of you that I'm, I'm very unaware of. <laughs> so here's a fun like diversion. So 11 or 12 years ago, I started playing kickball in Brooklyn. And in playing kickball, like a bunch of the guys in our kickball league, we would like all go to the um, turkey's nest afterwards and we'd uh, play flip cup and we'd play beer pong and we'd uh, there was an old school buck hunter machine in the back and like all of the guys like from kickball would just be like gathered around this buck hunter machine and they'd be like super competitive and I'm naturally a very fucking competitive person and they're all fucking playing buck hunter and I'm like well I want to fuck like I love video games I've been playing video games since I was seven I want to play whatever fucking video game they're playing because like it's a point and shoot I can fucking do that shit right and then I started playing and I was like okay this isn't as easy as I thought it was so like I started like practicing a little bit in the backhand and then one of my friends who uh, his name is Andy Lynn and uh, he showed me a few like tips on like how to play Buck Hunter. And when he showed me these tips and tricks on how to play Buck Hunter, I didn't know at the time that he was number five in the world at huh. Buck Hunter. So I started shooting really fucking well and so now, despite the fact that, like, I mean, I'm still not, like, good enough to go to, like, the world championships or anything. And I they have, have a world championship. There's for absolutely Hunter. world championships. It's how he, like, became number five in the world. Um, but, like, I have played with people who have gone to the championships. And, like, I was, like, the worst of the bunch, but I was still holding my own with them. So that's how I know. If you can beat me at Buck Hunter, I know you by name in New York City. And one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to do before the world broke was to get dressed up, especially like in like a super girly outfit. Like I'd put on like my cute little skirt and my heels and I'd do my hair up. It's a trap. And get my makeup. And then I'd go to a bar that had a well calibrated machine. And I knew in advance that the machine was perfectly fucking calibrated before I arrived. Because like there are bars that have like butt cutter machines, but they're not well calibrated. But I knew which ones did. So I'd go to the ones that had like a well calibrated machine and I'd show up and I would just if someone was already on the machine, I would be like, hey, can I play with you guys? And that's all I would ask. I would never, ever say that, like, I'm really good at this game. Can I play? I would never say that I wasn't good at the game. I would just ask, can I play with you? And their assumption was I was trying to flirt with them. My actual intention is. To destroy them. No, not even. I just want the fucking machine and I need to get you off the machine so that I can play. And the only way to get you off the machine is to whoop your ass because then you're going to go run. And, so like, you're, run saying the that, you're, you're saying the destruction was incidental. Oops. 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 If I got some free drinks out of it, great. So what happened was like I've actually had this happen twice at the same bar on two different nights where – I walked in just to play Buck Hunter with my friend. And like my friend Katie is actually pretty good too, because again, she played kickball with me. So she played kickball with the same guys that taught me how to play Buck Hunter. So like we all played Buck Hunter together at Good Company before it turned into a restaurant. Fuck you for taking Good Company away from us. But um, so we'd all like shoot together. And so she's pretty good at it too. And like she can like get three bucks almost every round as well. So like we walked into a bar. Is that the goal? Yeah, you want to get, get three bucks every round. Yeah, so you have three bucks that come up, but like, you what should, is this teaching young women? But like, you can't shoot a cow because like, if you shoot a cow, it ends your round. Um, it's a whole thing. It's cows are sacred at Buck Hunter. Okay, this game is cows on bucks. Okay, this game. Yeah, is, I get that, but why cows? I always thought it was like human beings or whatever. Wait, let me break it down. This game is super fucking sexist and low key pretty racist. So I'm literally the last. Not so low. It's not so low key. They literally supported uh, the duck. People, ah, uh, fuck. Duck like, Dynasty. Duck Dynasty, yeah. The Duck Dynasty people who were, like, very, like, out and proud racist. Like, very overt racist. Like, there is a Duck Dynasty section of Buck Hunter. This game is fucking racist. It's fucking sexist. 
they know both of these things and they don't give a shit. So I'm literally the last person that anyone expects to be good at this game. And so I'll come in and just be like, oh my God, <laughs> can I play Buck Hunter with you? And these guys who just think, oh, whatever, this cute little girl, she doesn't know shit. And like, I will use their toxic masculinity bullshit against them because I've had guys start playing with me and halfway through the four rounds that we're playing, they will walk away from the machine, like physically will not say a word, just physically walk away from the machine and just be done. And like one guy, like I, like we shot five rounds. I beat him by like 10,000 points. He was like, well, whatever, like you're pretty good at this game. But like my friend, my friend can absolutely beat you at this game. And I was like, okay, well, where's your friend? And so he like takes me over to his friend at the bar and he was like, yo, yo, you need to beat this girl at Buck Hunter. And like, he like introduces me to his two friends and like, Friend one was like, I'm not getting into this. I know better. Like, nah, nah, nah. I smell a shark and she's like already smelled blood in the water. Nah, I'm not playing this game. I'm not losing my fucking map. Nope, nope, I'm not playing. And his other friend took the bait like an idiot. And so like the two of them were just like, all right, we're going to show these two girls. And so Katie and I were just like, all right, cool. Like we just want the fucking machine. So whatever. So they come shoot with us. Original guy we get two rounds in and he's so far behind that he literally pretends to go to the bathroom and then just sneaks out of the bathroom and goes back to the bar and starts flirting with some other girl because he realizes that like he has no chance with me whatsoever or like with my friend. Your mastery of this game didn't make him want to chase you? No, because I heard Wait, his masculinity. Your, your mastery of this game gave him impotence. Uh-huh. His penis I stole his man it into his abdomen uh -huh. while he was playing with you. Yeah, he had a concave penis at this point. Yeah. It was really funny. He had a clitoris. Uh-huh. And he didn't know what to do with it. And it was really fucking funny. And he couldn't find it because he was too fucking toxic. Yeah. So. And then another time at the same bar, Katie wasn't there. But, like, I was just uh, dicking around and shooting. And um, this guy comes over and, like, I was like, oh, you want to play? Cause like, I always like playing with other people. Like I don't like just playing by myself. So you want to play? He's like, sure. Cool. So he starts playing, loses the first round. He's like, okay, let's play again. Halfway through the second time we're playing, he goes to the bathroom, does some Coke, comes back, announces, I just did some Coke. I'm definitely ready. Like, let's fucking go. And I beat him again by like 10, 15,000 points. And he was just like, what the fuck? What the fuck? I did some coke and I still didn't fucking win. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. Is cocaine a performance enhancing drug in, in this game? Well, I think he thought that it was going to make him see and think faster and shoot faster and move faster. It does give you that feeling. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> Is it accurate in the real world, though? Oh, no. It does actually, it translate? It made him worse. And it was so <laughs> funny because I was like, you should have done this sober, my guy. Oh. But like, it was just fucking hilarious to me because like he ended up walking away from the game as well, like halfway through because he was just so big mad that he couldn't beat me and I was and the thing is like if he had just asked me like have you ever played before I would have literally pulled my buck hunter card out of my wallet and you have a buck you hunter, have a buck buck hunter card, card. I, they, wait buck hunter cards are a thing yeah 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 because like you can log in and like once you log in like your information is stored and so you log in all it like you log in enough and they like an option pops up on the screen. Like you can like register for a buck hunter card on like buckhunter.com or whatever. And so you like register for the card and they send you the card in life. Yo, she has a buck hunter card. I'm just, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to say it. You're a fucking nerd. There are people who want to register to vote. Right. Right. <laughs> right. She got a buck right, hunter card. Right. right. So like if he had asked, if any of these dudes had ever fucking asked, I would have just pulled out my buck hunter card and been like, yeah, I'm I'm not really sure whether I'm impressed or <laughs> whether I should be worried about you. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm really fucking good at this game. But no one ever fucking asked. They just assume that because I'm a woman and is this is this some kind of kink thing, though, where it's like that's part of the kink, like that's part of the excitement for you is the fact that people don't ask. Oh, it's absolutely super fun for me. I love when guys are so toxically masculine that they will come up to me and just assume that they can beat me because I'm a woman. And I'm like, oh, honey, I'm going to make you eat shit. And so. So, like, so uh, I want to tell you that I, it, uh, many, many years ago in my dating phase, I've run into women like you. <laughs> I have. <laughs> 
it, you know, I'm going to date myself, but Latin quarters on a Thursday night used to be the spot in the arts. And I'll never forget because we were rolling deep, like seven, eight, seven, eight deep in those days. Mm-hmm. Rolling to the Latin quarters. We get, and we never waited online. We get inside the doorway and this woman standing on the inside of the doorway dressed to the nice with, with the look on her face that says, don't you fucking dare speak to me. Uh, but like, not hiding it. No, no. It was clear. She was like, don't even fucking try it. Why are you even bothering? And I went to my to the guys I was rolling with and I said, watch this. I walked up to her. I said something. She looked at me and we left. And they had, I never, ever told them what we, what I said to her. Okay. But like, are you going to tell us though? I said, I could ask you to dance or I could offer to buy you a drink like all these other motherfuckers. Or we can just leave and go fuck right now. And that's all she wanted. She looked at me like. Like, are you serious? And I looked at her like, and then she said, let's go. Yo. You have the best fucking game, Jackie. Like, if you gonna walk up to a beautiful woman and be like, yeah, I mean, I could buy you a drink. I could ask you to dance or we could just leave and go fuck right now. Like, yo, first of all, like, I would give you the same look like, bitch, you serious right now? But then also I'd be like, Okay, but like if you just gonna spit that kind of game, either you are all bark and no bite, or you are laying it all the way down and I should yeah, give you a chance. I, I, I have learned something over the course of my years. With great dick comes great responsibility. <laughs> Please tell me you have that on a t shirt. No. No, see here's the thing. You can't talk about great dick. You can only have it talked about for you. Mm-hmm. If you talk about it, it's no not one, that great. No one ever takes you seriously. Nope. No one ever, be- no matter how hard you throw down, if you actually talk about it, it's not that no great. one ever believes you. Correct. It's always better to undersell and let people and find over-deliver. and let people find the fuck out. Mm-hmm. Always. Every time. Always. Yo. And the other part, if we're gonna be real about it, is. Really good sex creates a kind of emotional connections that don't, aren't always meant to be maintained. And people will develop an emotional connection to you thinking, this person really cares about me. No, that's your oxytoxin talking. You had a bunch of orgasms. Yep. And uh, you have no. to understand that like this the connection that you feel, this is not reciprocal. So I'm going to keep my dick to myself because. I'm going to keep it moving. I am not trying to create connections that I can't maintain. And I don't want to keep create. I don't want to keep creating deeper and deeper connections that you like. This is one sided. Tell me about the letdowns. Like, how, how do you, you you go to all this length to wow someone to give them a wonderful experience to give uh, them it, that oxytocin to, to give them those well, orgasms but, but, to make them but, feel but to, but to make that, let me finish to make to make them feel like they're loved, and then you got to let them go. How do you, how do you let them go? But to be clear, it's not it's not this thing of I'm going to these lengths to give somebody. No, but just by you being you, though, <laughs> you're me, giving them an experience. Me being you're giving them an experience that that makes them feel like this is something more. But then you got to let them go. Out of the usual. But no one no one ever believes you. No one ever believes you. They yeah. believe I, you in the moment, right? But in the moment, I in no, the moment, but they don't believe the letdown is what in the moment. Saying. I will say. You have to understand that this is not what you think it is. Oh, you mean they don't believe you when you're letting them down? No. No, they think. Oh, that, they keep coming no. back for more. It's like oh, I, I listen. Mean, I, I have. I have. That could be whatever you. I need have. To be. I have been in bed with somebody after hours of aerobics and had the person look me in the eye and go, "I understand that you're not looking for a girlfriend right now, and it is what it is." And I looked. At, I looked at them and I said, "It's not that I'm not looking for a girlfriend. I just don't see you as that person." Woof. To their face? I mean, uh, I'd rather hear that direct honesty to be perfect. Like, I'm not knocking it. I'm just like, damn, yo, I wish I had the guts. But Yo, I'd rather what, actually hear that directly to my face. What is than, served by being dishonest? Right. Because like, I'd rather hear like, I'm not the one than to be led on. 
You can be uh, so right. You can be so right. And still, it can be so hard to follow in those footsteps. Why? Like, for you, maybe you can't answer that because for you, it's just second nature. Again, this is why I keep my dick to myself. (laughs) Wow. I, uh, again, I had my heart broken bad, uh, you know, over a decade ago at this point. And I only will form connections at this point that I know that I'm willing to maintain and grow. Otherwise, it's only it's a question of am I creating something where someone's going to believe this is something that it's not. And no matter how much somebody be- wants to say this is just sex, seven or eight or- orgasms later, they're going to go. So what are we doing? So what are we calling this? And it, I've had someone ask me that to my face. And my exact words were, don't make me name this because you will not like my answer. Mm. So so what's your usual timeline? Like, are you talking like four or five times and then you got to call it raps because people are catching feelings? Are you going you, like months? Uh, you're talking about somebody who existed years ago. The person who lived that life does, is not me anymore. Like, I, I'm not the, trying the, to say it's no, you. No, I'm just curious how that how, how that man operated at any point. Basically, John is trying to follow Asking your footsteps. Asking for a friend, obviously. Here's my asking for a friend answer. In my 30s, again, which is 20 years ago at this point. It's not like John is in his 30s right now or anything. You've got, you've got, you've got a three-month time limit before things start to go bad. At three Ooh, months... Ooh, that's, that's, that's hitting a little close to home right now. At three months, you either have to decide that you're going to be involved or go, listen, this isn't for me. Okay. Yeah, and it, it is only fair to be honest with people, and as as much of an asshole as I know I've been, I have not been a liar. Right, it's better to be honest, even if it makes you the asshole. Yeah, I've been an asshole, but I've not been the asshole who was deceitful, leading people on. Right, yo. Jackie, I appreciate you so fucking much because like I love that like your time limit and my time limit are we are on the exact same timeline because like from my perspective, anything before three months, I don't care how often I'm seeing you three months. We're not really dating. Like we could be like, quote unquote, exclusive or whatever bullshit you want to call it. But like three months, that's just like the trial period. Since when do you do exclusive? Okay, there was a time when I was monogamous. That time is not anymore, but like once upon a time in Astoria, like in Astoria, not in Brooklyn, but in like, a land far, far away. Once upon a time in Ohio, I tried to be monogamous, but like it didn't work out because ethical non monogamy is for me. Um, but like legitimately, even now to this day, like as I'm seeing someone, I. Within three months, it is casual. I don't care how hot and heavy we are. It is casual. After that three month mark, it has to be reassessed of, okay, do I want to continue spending my fucking time with you or are we? Three months is a probationary period. Yeah. Three months is like, that's, that's like your test phase. Some people call it the honeymoon period. Nah. Nah. No. no. If. The good stuff, if you stay together, doesn't start till after the three, three month months. Period. Yeah, because like yeah. in the first three months, like you're still on good behavior. Right. It's um, like, can I the, trust you to like actually be a freak? Yeah. Can Can I actually like talk to you about shit, or are we just fucking, or yeah, are you uh, just gonna bounce, or by three months, you know, I can actually be myself with this person, mm-hmm. and they're not going to, you know. Buy a therapist boat based on our conversations. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Buy a therapist a boat that uh, uh, that's heartbreaking. But it's true though. Like I yeah. listen again. I know. I only mean from like a financial perspective. That's I, heartbreaking. I, I know the asshole that I am. I know. I know people have bought therapist boats based on having a deal oh, with the no. shit. People have based on having a deal with my shit. How many therapists have named boats after you? I don't. I don't know. I don't want to know. <laughs> Um, I've put some therapist kids through college. Oh, Jesus Christ. But, yep. but like, is this our after hours episode? I feel like we need a whole new 
a whole new theme for this podcast. This <laughs> is this is fun time program after hours. Break out the rum, break out the whiskey. We're just we're just doing sex stories all night, baby. I, I hit a point of res- I hit a point of responsibility over a decade ago. You grew where it was up. like I can't do this. It's it's unfair. What triggered that? I told I told you what triggered it. The combination of realizing that I needed more and actually having my heart broken. Mm-hmm. Like I can't, I can't do this anymore. It's not fair. So, so, right. so what is what is dating like after that? Exquisite, because better. You, it's so much better because you only are with people who can meet you mentally, physically, spiritually, sexually, emotionally, energetically. And although it is rare that that happens, every time it is worth it. So, it, like, because the bar has been set so much higher. You don't settle for less. No. You're not just chasing every hot girl down the street. You're like, okay, well, I'll start with like, you're really fucking hot. But also, oh, I can't sit down to dinner with you. So this isn't going anywhere. I I start with I start with. Are are we energetically connected? Mm -hmm. And after that, everything else can happen. Is that like asking a girl what her sign is? No, no. it's. I am deeply empathic. John, I will kick you out of this studio. You know what? That's the funniest thing, though, because that literally, in my brief time on Tinder. (laughs) I don't even understand. I mean, legitimately, the only the only red flag that I have developed at this point is when somebody wants to talk about their fucking astrology shit. If you want to talk about astrology with me, I need to I need to go the other direction. Okay, like. If we're going to be real, real, I can go down a whole laundry list of red flags on Tinder. That's another red flag for me. If you're listing your red flags in your profile, that's a red flag. Okay. Okay. Listing red flags in your profile. Yes. No, I'm not saying you're doing that. But that's the other thing that I've noticed that like these girls, they're like, if you're this, 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 or this, or that, I'm not going to date you. I'm like, that's how you lead. Like that's what you're leading with. So like, it's really funny because like I can look at Tinder profiles and like, I can. We need to do an episode on this. I've never had a Tinder account, so I don't. Okay, know. I appreciate you, Jackie. We're gonna get you a Tinder account, and no, we're gonna you're do. Not. We're no, gonna do. No, 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 no you're not. No, no, for entertainment no, value. Not. No, no, no. You can just like we can just look through my Tinder because it's fucking hilarious, and I forget that I have and it mine. most of the time. Um, your Tinder might be ridiculous, so like maybe not, but like in a good way. So we're just not gonna. We're gonna ignore John's Tinder because John t- John's Tinder is just. I not- am taking offense at this moment. I'm just gonna let it slide. Okay, I'm like, not even sure where you're okay, going with that, but okay, we're gonna okay. we're gonna let you finish your story. Okay, John, I have a quick. I'm question. gonna let you finish. I have a quick question. I have a quick question though. <laughs> Hit me. What's your bio? Do you want to know? Oh yeah, you can Let's fucking it. read it to me. Oh, I, I I have it memorized. Tell me what it is. I have I my entire bio memorized because it's like three words, isn't it? Four words. <laughs> Five syllables. All I said was, "I need a haircut, man." That was it. I got girls on Tinder offering to cut my hair. I haven't responded to any yet. I, I don't know if I just, I don't know if I respond to somebody based on their dexterity with scissors. Yo, that but, was kind of my reaction to it. It was mostly just like I didn't want to fuck with this game, and I was like, I didn't know what to fucking say, and I was like, I, this is my way of basically telling people I'm not really on here. You know what I mean? Uh huh. You're not really on here, but like, but you on here? I'm uh-huh. curious, but I ain't responding to shit. Like I'm not, I'm not answering but you're those not, messages. Though? I have not answered a single message about cutting my hair. No, not about cutting your hair, but you've actually talked to people on Tinder for sure. You've met people from Tinder. Why you got to be calling me out like this? Because you started this bullshit. She's she you got to this. This is the after hours episode, (laughs) but we still got to have some sense of decorum. I mean, no, we don't. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Jackie. I feel like you had a story that I interrupted. You did. Tell me. Tell me about your Tinder. Okay. well, first of all, I would have swiped left on you real fucking hard because of your stupid bio. Like I'm trying to figure out, is that a diss in this modern world or? Yes. Okay. True facts. It is. But also here's why, because you would have hit two red flags on my like, don't I don't fuck with y'all on Tinder. So one, if all of your pictures are selfies or all but one are selfies, I swipe left. If I don't have a single selfie in my profile, you don't have a picture of with anyone else on your Tinder. That's because I don't have any friends. I swipe left. <laughs> if you don't have anything in your bio that tells me literally anything about yourself i swipe left if uh you have a picture of you sitting in a car specifically with a car seatbelt on because i had not noticed this a trend until you mentioned it literally i like just to point this out she's like i'm gonna hop on tinder two minutes later two minutes i 
Fa- Swipe left a few times, found it immediately. What is it with these car selfies? I had not noticed this previous to it's, you it's mentioning It's such it. a distinct thing. Like women especially do this, but guys totally do this too, where they take pictures of like take selfies in their car. And most of the time they're wearing a seatbelt when they're taking these selfies. And I'm like, okay, y'all know that natural lighting exists outside of the car too. Like you could have just stepped outside of the car. I don't understand why you had to stay in the car to be like, Oh, look at me. I'm in a car. And like half the time they're in the passenger seat of the car. So like, okay, you in an Uber taking these fucking photos? Like, what are you doing? So like, okay. So she don't, she don't want no scrubs. Uh, I don't want no scrub. A scrub is a guy or girl that can't get no love from me. You better not own own that you you better own that uber is what you're trying to say okay but like even so like if you're taking a picture from the driver's seat like why you stop in to take a picture of yourself in the fucking driver's seat with your seatbelt on just get the fuck out of the car and like take a picture of you in front of the car take a picture of you on the car take a picture of you on the hood of the car that's much hotter than you sitting in the fucking take like, a picture of you on someone else's hood. hey oh yeah is that the way to go have someone else take a picture of you on that hood hey, hey. i'm about that life so i won't fuck around with people who do that. I also don't fuck around with people who take selfies from above, like the above selfie. Cause like even the hottest fucking people like it's, take it, the, it's, it's a Decepticon. Yeah. When you take the above selfie, like I don't trust you. And also if like every single one of your pictures, you are looking super fucking above and beyond. Like I've done my makeup. I've done my hair. I've done like, I'm like super perfect in every photo. I don't trust you because that means I'm not like I'm when I show up to the date, I'm going to be like really turned on. But when I wake up next to you, you're going to be a lagoon creature and I'm not about that life. So. I don't think I've ever been a lagoon creature when I woke up. What does that even mean? It means you're not as hot when you wake up as you were before you went to bed. I feel like that's a girl thing. I mean, that's most people. But like, I mean. Do guys get less attractive when they wake up in the morning? Mm, depends on how attractive they perceive themselves or like they picture themselves to be on their Tinder profile. Lagoon creature. Mm-hmm. So then also. Like, this is like a whole new world for me. You you have some experience with this. Uh, I mean, I'm and this met- is a, someone who has met two people on Tinder. And how, how many lagoon creatures have you met the I, night after I, hooking I up with someone? I have never woken up to a, to a lagoon creature, but I will say this. If you don't wake up to somebody whose hair and makeup is a mess, what did you even do? Right. I mean, I expect your hair and makeup to be a mess. But like if you are a mess that I'm like suddenly super not attracted to, like if the whole attraction of you is just your hair and makeup, then you're not that attractive to me because like that means that you're either very superficial or very vapid. And like I like someone who can like at least in one of their profile pictures show a more natural look, especially like when it comes to women, because like, okay, I appreciate that. Like I look great with makeup on and I will absolutely put makeup on and I will put effort into putting makeup on, have makeup on right now. What's up? But I have never worn makeup on a date. I mean, you should time. just putting that out there. You, There's time. You can fix that. Like eyeliner looks good on all genders. Point is, why are you so against eyeliner? I have nothing against eyeliner. I'm I'm just trying to wrap my head around this lagoon creature concept. What turns someone into a lagoon creature overnight? There it, are people who spend so much time making themselves into some, into something that they are not. Yep. That when the makeup and the hair comes down, they look like someone different. And well, but, but 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 wait, if they were a lagoon creature before they put that makeup on, then let them live their fucking best life with the makeup on. Because who are you to tell them they should be a lagoon creature all the time? It sure. is not a question of it, whether or not they're living their best life. It's a question of it's just, like catfishing. It's it's a question of honesty. So you're saying that they should have gone to that date all natural, looking like a no, lagoon creature no, 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 when you first like, met them. No, no, no. So Wait, here's the thing. Like, I abs- Would you have hooked up with them had they looked like a lagoon creature no, when you I first absol- met them? So, okay, so but I absolutely appreciate someone who like puts a little bit of effort and like puts some makeup on, sure. But like if you have like full contour on your fucking face, if you're doing like full like almost stage makeup to the point where your face looks completely different when you take your makeup off. Like when I take my makeup off, I recognize that I look different than when I put my makeup on. Different isn't lagoon creature though. Right. But I don't look different. I don't look so different that it feels like you're looking at two different people. 
when so let, let me throw this out there as as a as a guy in his 50s i'll be 53 next week here's my idea of what dating is like at this point in my life come to my house i'm going to fix you an amazing meal and jackie's a great cut bring some sweats figure mm-hmm. out you know, like you know do you like love do you, do you like uh Lovecraft Country because we're watching that. Oh my god! If we're you don't gonna, love Lovecraft Country, we can't be fucking. Like, gonna, that's gonna, immediate. That's gonna, like an immediate red flag. We're gonna talk about it for like two, three hours after yep. that, and we might even uh, listen to the podcast. We don't have to have sex because I'm not actually here to have sex. I'm here to make an actual connection. human connection, mm-hmm. and if that connection results in sex, great. But like, that's not what I'm here for. Like. Put your hair up in a bun. Mm-hmm. Put your feet up on the couch. Yeah, relax. I, I, Be yourself. I, I'll, I'll appreciate it, like if you, you know, you clip your toenails, preferably. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but like if you take your street shoes off. But the Yo, goal, don't put your fucking street shoes in my bed. If the goal is to look like your your hair and makeup was put through it, why would I want you to show up looking? different like you can show up looking like you are yeah and that's good because i would rather appreciate who you are and like the thing is like i don't just date like super like i don't date like only super hot people i don't date like only models or whatever like i've dated plenty of people who like are not the most attractive but they were attractive to me and i you mean they were lagoon creatures until they put their makeup on no, I mean, like, even after they put makeup on, they were still were like fours or fives. But like they were interesting to me and I like their personalities and I connected with them on more than just a superficial attraction. So like that's where I feel like I, so I would rather. I get that. What I'm struggling with is this idea that the next morning all of a sudden they are. Because it feels like it's my my a my, farce my thing. In a way. My thing is my my fear isn't the lagoon creature. My fear is uh, let me tell you. Let me tell you how I stopped dating models. Yep. Again, this is the art. So this is you know fifteen almost twenty years ago, and I'm working every day as, as a as a model in New York City. And I'm at this party, a bunch of models there, and this French girl starts talking me up, and she's telling me about all of the. Things that are filming locally that she wants to be a part of because she doesn't want to model, she wants to act. Oh, and she's talking about this show and that show and that show. And I'm drinking heavily <laughs> in the hope that she'll get more interesting. Oh, mm-hmm. Jesus. And finally, like she says to me, well, you know, what's your favorite TV show? What do you want to be on? And I say to her with the sweetest face I can make, because it's true, The Simpsons. Nice. And then I say, you know, I know a casting director for The Simpsons. I bet I can get you a walk on. Yo. Oh, that's the, beautiful. The, and that is the most like, oh, that that's yeah. that's the most brilliant fucking. Yeah, yo, yeah. I appreciate every I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to watch that interaction. How did happen. that play out? The next morning, as I looked out her perfect naked body stretch out across my bed, I thought to myself, can't do this anymore this is like taking advantage of a special needs child (laughs) so for me i'm not concerned with someone looking different in the morning i'm concerned with waking up the next morning and being do i actually want to like cook breakfast with this person and talk to them yeah or do i just want to get the fuck out of here yep yep because like the thing is like i really appreciate people who are like I can actually share a connection with. Yeah. And I feel like if you are going through the time, effort and energy in every single one of your Tinder photos, especially to like have like you're putting two hours minimum of time into doing your makeup just to take a Tinder photo or like to go out and like take a photo that you use for Tinder. Like to me, are you only ever going to see me after putting two hours of makeup on? I get that. Yeah. Or are you like willing to see me 
bare face. When you face. look like a swamp creature. Yeah, because like I'm totally down. So now it's a good thing to be a swamp creature? Again, I will happily date swamp creatures if I know that the swamp creature is coming. So it's not the swamp creature that's the problem. It's the farce that leads to the letdown right. when they eventually become. What is that? Is that like a Cinderella reference? It's somehow? catfishing. Oh. It's just be you. Yeah, that's all Whoever I want. Whoever you are, be that person. Like, and, that, and we'll figure it I out I don't from care there. what shape you are. Like, I have been really attracted to some, like, really big girls. And I'm just like, you know. What are you trying to say about big girls? I fucking like big they girls. They can get it. Yeah, they can fucking get it. They can get and, like, it. I, like, you don't have to be, like, model hot. You don't have to be, like, conventionally pretty for me to be like, yeah, what's up, though? Like, what's actually up, though? I want to know about the Taoism of dating. So I'm a devoted Taoist. I have been for decades. And Taoism is about a way of living. It's not about uh, attention to uh, God as a personal concept. But mostly it is about being present in your moments. It is about appreciating the irreplaceable nature of each second as it passes and making sure that you are giving everything to that second no matter what it is that you are doing so Taoism is doubt if there's a Taoism of dating it is about being attentive and i want to say that there's probably not a more efficacious quality that anyone can have if they are actively dating than being attentive. Don't think. Just be in the moment and respond. Notice how someone looks. Notice how someone smells. Notice the tone of their laughter. Notice what makes them laugh. Find out what their interests are. Be present. Listen and be aware so that you can respond in real time to the signs of each moment. Don't have a plan because life's unplanned. Life is chaotic and wonderful and beautiful. And if you are in your moment, if you are embracing the Intractable, unpredictable, and unpredictability of it all. You always know what the right thing to do, and that applies to sex as well. The ancient Taoists had compendiums written on sex, which is one of the reasons I became Taoist. I love to drink and fuck, <laughs> and the point was never about an end goal. The point was always the experience. I, I've i forgotten how to have a sexual experience that is meant to have an end goal unless I'm masturbating. Like masturbation is about, you know, you're getting from point A to point B. Sex is about sharing energy and space with another human being and responding in real time to what that person requires. And there isn't a a goal there isn't an end except to enjoy and fully soak in and respond to each moment so for me Taoism the way of life is being present and not having a plan but responding in the moment and not trying to do something right or wrong there's a principle in Taoism called Wu Wei. And Wu Wei, roughly defined, is going to sound illogical. But the rough definition is, by doing nothing, all things are accomplished. Hmm. And it doesn't mean actually doing nothing. It means by not trying, but by just responding instinctively. Everything happens the way it's supposed to. So if you're supposed to breathe, you'll breathe. If you're supposed to put one foot in front of the other, you'll put one foot in front of the other. 
if you are responding to somebody energetically and it tells you to lick counterclockwise circles around your clitoris, that's what you do because that is exactly what the moment requires of you. Mm-hmm. And the next moment will require something else of you and you have to be aware of that. You can't be focused on the past. You can't think about the future. Pay attention to your moments and the moment will tell you what it needs of you. That's Taoism in its essence. It's beautiful. How did you discover this? Oh, my father was Muslim and my mother was Christian. Is Christian. My mom's still alive. I lost my dad 17 years ago. And at some point early in their marriage, they decided to never discuss religion. That sounds like, smart. You worship your God. I worship my God. We're never going to talk about it. And the kids are going to do what the kids are going to do. So there was no influence for you? No, ton, no, 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 Ton, tons and tons of influence, but no pressure to decide. So by five years old, I'd figured out that my parents didn't worship the same God. Hmm. By seven, I started to wonder which of them was right. Hmm. By nine years old, I considered the possibility that they were both wrong. And by 10, I was like, well, what else are they wrong about? Oh, wow. So by the time I was 15, I had read from cover to cover the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the Tao Te Ching, the Five Rings. I read all of the texts and made a choice to step away from Abrahamic religions Mm -hmm. because Taoism resonated with so from 15 already this was something that you had been exploring i started to read uh religious texts as a teenager Mm -hmm. but in my 20s i decided that that was the most way i wanted to go yeah wow that makes sense so how does uh spirituality affect your life in your day-to-day is it something that you like consciously practice is it something that's like kind of in the background the point of spirituality as far as Taoism goes is to have it be like breathing it's always there and you're unaware of it but it's something that you do the hardest part of not trying is trying not to try (laughs) yeah (laughs) um This is the conundrum of meditating. Meditation is something that improves as with practice. There's a great text that I always return to called The Unfettered Mind, which is the writings of a Zen priest to a samurai in the 18th century. And basically he tells him, if you think about what you're going to what you're doing, you're going to die. If you're fighting 10 guys and you think, hey, I'm fighting 10 guys, you're going to die. If you're fighting 10 guys and you think, hey, I've drawn my sword, you're going to die. If you think, hey, I drew my sword and I killed the first guy, the next nine guys are going to kill. And if if at any point your mind stops to think about what you are doing, Mm -hmm. you are going to die. So the point is to not trap your mind, to let it flow to what is supposed to happen. And the things that are supposed to happen will actually keep you alive. As soon as as soon as your mind stops, whether you are thinking about something that's happened or something that is about to happen, you're in the waiting place. And the waiting mm-hmm. place is where people go to die. Gotcha. So the point is never to be in the waiting place. Do not think about the past. Do not think about the, the future. Ensconce yourself so deeply in the immediacy of the moment that that's all that matters and you respond accordingly. That makes sense. It's act on instinct, act on reaction, act on uh, previously learned skill. I was going to say it requires training. Well, we've all done it. Like if you can walk, you are doing something that you've done for so long that you don't have to think about it. If you ever walked home from somewhere that you've been 
a on a regular times. basis. Mm -hmm. You have done this thing where you are doing it without thinking about it. You're there are like so many kitchen. things that you do without thinking about that you don't think about them, that you don't even you don't even know that you are practicing Wu Wei. Wu Wei is a principle that can be extended across all all aspects of your life, and that's that's the beauty of it is progress to a point in all things where you are not reacting but responding to the immediacy of the moment and if you do that everything's taken care of if you're not worried you don't have anxiety about the past you don't have depression about the future you the things that needed, needed to be done were done in their moment in, the, in their time and that's in life in dating in sex and everything i love that i love that that's beautiful Coffee like that. Cannot, we, should, we should call it the light after that. Like I, I feel like I feel like after everything we've been through tonight, that was the moment we were looking for. That was, most that was everything that tied it together. Mm -hmm. Jackie, what a pleasure! Thank you for coming in. Thank this you for making the time to spend this time with perfect. us. Yeah. An absolute honor. Thank you so much. Ah. We had such a great time talking to you. And we barely scratched the surface. I we know. Did. We could talk to you for hours. But the surface was was worth scratching. Absolutely. People forget the surface of this planet is miles deep. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Don't don't get me started on on geolo geology and astrophysics. We'll save it for <laughs> next time. Absolutely. Indeed. All right. We're going to have to have you back so we can dive much deeper. Hey, I'm around. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank Love you, you Jackie. both. You have a good night. Thanks for checking out this clip from our show. To watch more clips or full episodes, click on our profile below. If you want to stay up to date on all of our new episodes and videos, click subscribe. And if you have any ideas for future guests or topics that you would like to see us cover on the show, leave us a message in the comments or connect with us on any of our social media channels at Funtime Program or on our website at FuntimeProgram.com. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.